I like it. All right, everyone, as you're jumping in, we've got over 2,000 of you registered. Uh, we'll probably get up to about 600 live in and out. Let us know what city, what state, what country you're from. I know we're all over the place. And we're here to help you grow your business. And this first hour is all these great people over here. We'll go through some intros. But I want to lay the groundwork. Every hour, we're going to be giving away a swag bag. We're going to pick somebody randomly who shouts out their name or whatever we decide to do within that hour. And this is why we're talking about watches. We're also giving away an Apple watch. So that's going to be towards the end as we wrap up. So hang in there. This is recorded. So don't worry about it. If you miss something, you want to go back to it. We can definitely go back. Uh, but we're going to go through some intros and then I'm going to hand it over to Stuart. Let's start with Stuart. Stuart, let's go. All right. Uh, I'm Stuart Sim, uh, Vice President of Real Estate Industry Development at Lofty. Um, super excited to be taking part in the ACA, AC, LCA Virtual Summit today. I think it's going to be some great content um, and lots to talk about. I love sure. it. Thanks. Adam, how about you, man? Tell us a little bit about you. Thank you for having me. Um, I am a Lofty CRM specialist. I do a lot of uh, setups, training, consulting, a lot of fun stuff. I use it for my outbound lead referral business. I've been using it for about five years. I'm uh, currently licensed in Wisconsin. I moved to Pensacola, Florida a few months ago, and I love it here. So very happy to be here. Listen, I saw your post about the double hamburger and the fries. That, that was is amazing. Ridiculous, wasn't it? <laughs> That almost she had to give, made she had to give to me Florida. a second bun to finish it. It was like, yeah, I was I was not expecting that. So, oh, I like but it. How about you, Robert? That was, that was eighteen dollars and worth every dollar of it. That was amazing. Going on. Good morning. Uh, my name is Robert. Run a. We have a portfolio of companies in different aspects of real estate. One of which is Lucido Global. We sell a billion dollars of real estate a year, and then there's a few others, including Moxie Mortgage, which obviously is on the lending side. I like it. Thank you, Robert. And then John Key, tell us a little bit about you. Hey, everyone. This is John Key. I'm John Key. <laughs> um, with the John Key Patel team, I've used Lofty for probably about five, six years now and love every part of it. But I am in Fremont, uh, Northern California. I love it. All right. And then I'm Tristan. I run a small team out of Los Angeles, Ventura County in real estate since 2004. Also have uh, a whole bunch of companies that we run. Uh, one of those is Lab Code Agents and Tristan and Associates and Y Realty. So let's get going, guys. Stu, I want you to punt this off and lead us to where we're going. Yeah, it sounds good. Uh, so, you know, for me, if, if you've seen me on webinars or you've talked to me in person, I'm super positive about the real estate industry. And for the last year and a half, we've obviously been going through some challenges with low inventory uh, high interest rates, the NAR rulings, everything that's going on. So I think this is a perfect time for us to actually get together and talk about a lot of these things as we move from 2024, which we'll say was a bit of a disaster, into 2025, which has a lot of positive news coming out, right? So we've had recently some interest rates drop, um, starting to shift into what I believe is going to make changes in the marketplace. I don't see it happening probably till May of June, May or June. But what we should be doing is kind of planning for 2025. So what I'm going to do is ask a couple of you a very simple question, right? Uh, Robert, how are you preparing for 2025 uh, with all the changes that are coming in the RE industry? Well, the best way to hit your goals next year is not to wait until next year to start working on them. And that applies for teams, brokerages, and also individual agents. So if you're actually, you know, most people would say I'd kill for that opportunity or I'd give anything to be there, but really like they wouldn't even wake up 60 minutes earlier to start working on their dreams. So the first thing I would say is actually commit to what you want, have clarity, write it down, share it freely, and then commit to it. And don't wait until January to make a new year's resolution start now. Um, in or, regards or a month to our, ago. <laughs> yeah. I mean, why wait? wait do it yeah. today. Um, but in regards to our industry specifically, um, in reality, nothing has really changed in terms of a general sales industry. You know, one of the best things that you could actually do is 
maybe go to work in a different sales industry and learn actually how to generate business and close. Um, all the settlement really did is pull back some of the veil, which puts the onus on the individual to actually be a competent salesperson. So best way you can prepare for next year is again, to get started today and then actually really become a competent individual, both to make the initial sale and then to follow up and fulfill the service. Awesome. Awesome. What about yourself, Janky? What do you think of that question? How do you prepare for the upcoming year? You know, you've been doing this a while uh, and you're clearly doing well at what you do. So how do you get ready for the next year and the changes? That's a great question, Stuart. And I agree with Robert what he said, but I also want to add consistently stay focused. That's what we're doing every single day. Dilute all the noise that you hear. There's so much going on out there. So I just kind of like put blinders on <laughs> and Tristan knows this, knows this really well. I just put my blinders on. I stay focused consistently. I build relationships in the process. I come from a place of always con contribution, like giving to my clients or leads in my CRM. And then I do it daily and stay focused. Just do it daily. When you do it daily, uh, it will definitely be there. So that's how I'm preparing for next year. So repetition, you're doing the repetition. same stuff. You're making sure that what works is going to continue to work. And as we, as we get into the new year, you're going to be prepared. That's Absolutely. awesome. So and, and also at the same time, just quick question, a quick um, summary of something is that I don't wait for my team to tell me what to do. We work together. So whether it's dialing or whether it's, you know, contacts or whatever, we do it together. That's great. And that's obviously what's key to having a really successful team is making sure communication is good and you do work together. So that's awesome. Thanks for that advice, Janky. It's great. Tristan, I'm going to jump to you. Um, you. You've been doing this a long time. You're an expert. You're a thought leader in the industry. Um, what strategies have been the most effective for generating high quality leads in today's competitive real estate market, right? We, mm. we are seeing low inventory, which makes things much more competitive. Give me some thoughts on that. Uh, so high quality leads, man, that's a, that's a good question. I want to start with saying that real estate prospecting, I think is, has changed a bit over the last few years, specifically, I think more you're seeing it this year where those agents that didn't realize it had changed, they're now mm -hmm. um, trying to play catch up. And I think it's more uh, on the attraction based, but a lot of that has to do with our skills mm -hmm. that we didn't even know we needed. And that those are skills and conversation, skills and conversation to, to really come from a point of asking questions to see where people, where people are, are truly at, uh, you know, Robert and I interviewed Phil. Is it, what was it? Robert, Phil, what? Jones. Yeah, there you go. He wrote a book, dude, Phil, you know what, Robert, what the hell was the book he wrote? <laughs> exactly what to say. Exactly what to say. Thanks, Robert. I appreciate it. And he was saying the same thing. He's like, hey, we've got to come from a place of curiosity where we're asking a lot more questions because the one thing that, that we all hear, if we're going for high quality leads, and let's just say some of those high quality leads are online leads, we're not asking the right questions. We want to instantly go to show qualify and find out if they're working with another agent before really discovering where they're at, right? And the same thing when we get a seller. So I think first I would say real estate prospecting has changed, but I think we need to work on our approach first to catch up because this is now an attraction based business. How are you attracting people? Not only people that you meet, but people that watch what you're doing on the five most visited websites in the world, Google, YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, and X. What are you doing? That's my short answer. No, and, it, and it's a good answer. And I think when you come, when you start talking about strategy around leads, right, we all, uh, well, a lot of people in the industry get trapped with paying quite a bit of money for online leads. But part of that is also building your brand out so people are familiar with you in your market. So Robert, maybe expand on what Tristan's talking about when it comes to generating high quality leads. And I know you're very good at it. Well, I appreciate that. You know, I, it's my belief that basically for the last 20 years, unfortunately, agents have really lost the ability, like Tristan said, of how to attract clients. In other words, any advertisement you see, whether it's on TV, magazine, movie theater, on X, on Instagram, on YouTube, any advertising is making an offer for immediate response. 
And so if I ask the room right here to go ahead and put in the chat box, what's your number one offer that you're making to solicit business? Most people would not have a specific offer that they've made, nor have it even considered what their offer is. And I believe that's because a large portion of the Asian population has outsourced their lead generation to the big aggregators like Zillow. And when you do that for decades in a row, it's no fault of your own that you just lose that aptitude. And so if you want to attract higher quality leads, you need to make a better offer. And so one of the best things you could do before the end of the year is to figure out who your ideal client is and then construct an offer that will resonate with that specific target audience. That's how you'll get higher quality leads by making specific offers with specific uh, audience in mind. Solid. Uh, Janky, I'm going to take a little different step with you on this one. I'm going to ask you, really, can you share any pitfalls or common mistakes agents or members of your team should try and avoid when they think about lead generation and converting those leads? The industry tradi traditionally hasn't been very good at conversion. What are your thoughts around avoiding those pitfalls? I think the first question not to ask is, are you looking to buy or sell? You're not building a relationship. <laughs> First thing to do, my advice from the last couple of years that I've noticed, and this year specifically, is build that relationship. I think I'm all about building the lead, the relationship with the lead, um, whether it's at a $5 million lead that came in at, or a $500,000 lead, doesn't matter. Build that relationship. Give them what they want. Like they've come to your website for a certain reason. So don't make a mistake of asking, are you looking to buy or sell? Where one of the things that I noticed that I stopped our team from asking is, when do you have time to talk to Janki right away? No, don't do that. Let them browse the website, give them some space. Just go ahead and try to come up, well, come up with the question of saying, you know, um, building that relationship, coming from an aspect of, hey, can I send you a free list of homes? Or, hey, can I send you a free, a free CMA? to kind of give you an idea of what the market is doing in your county, your neighborhood, um, your city, you know, things of that sort. Don't ask questions about real estate right away. Ask them, how are they doing? You know, come from an angle of, you know, caring, so to speak, you know? Hey, Adam, since we've got you on here, I'm going to ask you that same question because you're heavily involved, obviously, in the industry and, you know, thought leadership around CRM and things like that. So, what pitfalls would you suggest to your agents to avoid when it comes to lead generation? Now, I know the consumer has become much more educated, obviously. So we have to maintain that air of professionalism without question. But give me some thoughts around that. I would say stop focusing on commodities and focus on compassion instead. Um, I think when you identify the skills and um uh, the skills and experience that you have in helping clients. And this is a little bit more difficult for new agents, but just kind of look back at your previous employment history um, to, to kind of, you know, search for the answers there. But when you close transactions with clients, you will build a certain kind of demographic profile as far as like, you know, is this, like, are you really good at military relocation? Are you really good at first time home buyers? Are you really good at, more like the you know investment short-term rental kind of a situation like who who do you help the most so identifying your expertise is really key ease, yeah and then once you do that you can come with the compassion that's necessary to actually offer solutions instead of everything like everybody can run a facebook ad nobody cares <laughs> about that like that's that's a commodity right what do you actually do that's going to resonate with who you're trying to attract so that mm -hmm. you can help them through their journey that's more important than, Hey, I can put a sign in your yard and everything else. Like everybody is, everybody's trying to be a generalist, being a specialist into looking mm -hmm. internally into what you can actually do for somebody and focus on what you can do to help solve their problem of, you know, buying or selling with whatever concerns they have regarding that process. That's where your lead generation um, focus should be. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you for contributing. I know you're you're going to be heavier later on in the whole uh, three hour session, but thanks for that. I thought you would have a good opinion on that. And Jenkins, I'm going to go back to you for this next question first. How are your 
agents or your team differentiating yourself from the competition in your market today? Our value proposition, it's that simple. We do a buyer or a seller consultation on Zoom. That's the first thing we do. And, the, and when I was talking to a lead yesterday, they asked me, so how much will it cost me to do a Zoom consultation with you? And I said, nothing. Actually, it, it's it's um, just giving you some guidance, some uh, education. So we start with, you know, sharing. We come from, we ask questions such as, you know, uh, something leading towards how are we going to guide them? How are we going to educate them? And what are we going to share with them in terms of market analysis, market insights, right? Again, come from compassion, like Adam said. Um, and I said earlier, come from an angle of contribution. Give, give, give is my way of doing it. Did I answer the question? <laughs> yeah, yeah, you did. No, it's good. I'm going to okay. ask Tristan. Tristan, I, I want you to put your broker hat on here for a second. And I know you you know, have all these diff different businesses. And one of those is coaching, right? So how do you get your agents when you're coaching them or part of your roster to differentiate themselves from the competition in their marketplaces? And you're dealing with people all over North America. So it's super interesting yeah. for me. Yeah, so I think every every area is a little different. So we, we were so close to dealing with people that do extreme luxury, like Beverly Hills, Calabasas, Malibu. And then we have like the regular we even have mobile homes, right? $33,000. So it's a big mix. And I think the first thing I thought of when you asked the previous question, which ties into this one, was when Robert and I were talking, uh, we were talking about ways that people, that we can provide value to people. And I think this is where we need to figure out, well, wait a second, what do they value first, right? And it really comes down, if you want to write this down, everyone, this is the one you want to write down. It comes down to four things. It's are you going to make me more money or am I going to lose money using you by what you're telling me or what you're doing, right? That's that's one thing we don't think of. And are you going to save me more time or make me more time? Give me more time, right? And in the world that we're in, most of the time they're going to hire us. We're like, wow, this guy's going to do everything for us, right? It gives me more time and more money. And then on top of that, we're looking at risk. Is this person going to alleviate my risk? Are they going to sell my home faster because I need to get to where I need to get to? And the one we forget about completely is status. Like, how does it make me feel? Does this make me, does this get me to where I need to get to? And then that's how, and then I'm going to pass this over to Robert really quick. That's how we start creating the offer. Like, what does that offer then look like based on those based on those values that people that we're trying to connect with have. Robert, how do we transition to that if we want to create an offer? Well, first you need to figure out who your call out is. In other words, who your target audience is, because if you're trying to make one general offer for everyone, it will by definition underperform a more specific offer. And I can give you an example. Um, Dean Graciosi, if you guys know who he is, he does a lot of work with Tony Robbins. Years back, he wrote a book. And he went on Larry King Live when that was the dominating show. And he did an interview and their idea was to clip the interview and create an ad campaign. And they did that and they spent a quarter of a million dollars in the initial weekend and they fundamentally sold nothing. And so they went back to the drawing board to try to figure out why their ad was just such a big flop. And they compared it to their ads of the, of the past. And they realized it was because they screwed the pooch on the first 10 seconds, the initial call out <laughs> who they were trying to address. So get this, he built a mock studio to resemble the exact Larry King Live, flew Larry King Live in just to reshoot the first 30 seconds. And then they relaunched the campaign and they sold like 10 million books or something crazy like that. So when you, you know, someone mentioned the chat, Alex Ramosi, uh, he quotes another guy who quotes another guy. Whenever you spend a dollar in advertising, 90% of it is spent in the headline. And so you have to really nail who you're trying to talk to and then anchor that at the very beginning. And then once you've established who you're trying to court business from, then you have to talk about what Tristan just said. You know, um, how do you alleviate their risk? How do you save them time? How do you maximize their income? And how do you elevate their status? Status is a huge need that people m significantly overlook. And I can give you one example before I turn it back over. Uh, I know an individual down here um, who bought a very high-priced home for cash. Uh, just under 20 million. And he had a penthouse then to sell and wanted to intentionally overlist it by a few million. He got an offer about a million dollars below, but
but didn't want to take it because he didn't want people to think that he needed to sell the house because of status. It wasn't based on money. It wasn't based on time. His primary motivating factor was status. And so if you're trying to sell to very successful people, especially people that have an ego, sell into that vision. Instead of trying to sell them a car saying it, you know, uh, has, you know, this number of liters, you know, it's a V8 twin turbo, you know, all the different ins and outs. Instead of trying to sell the features of the car, you sell the status around it. You know, what, the what, what, what the, the status, yeah. What the guys will say when you pull up to the golf course and their jaws hit the floor when you see the, that you pull up with a new Ferrari with golf clubs hanging out the back, that type of thing. So sell into their status. And, and there's two things that motivate people in and around status. Uh, a perceived elevation of their status by doing something that you can provide or mm -hmm. a perceived loss of status by not doing it. So. Yeah. And you know, that, that loss and gain goes for all four of those things. You're so right, man. Like, Hey, what are my, am I feeling as I'm talking to you that I'm going to be actually riskier hiring you? There's like, there's no way I'm going to hire you. Right. And sometimes we don't even know that. Good point. A lot yeah. And the status happens. thing is very true. A lot right, of that. So go ahead, Jenky. Robert, a lot of that happens here at the Bay Area, okay? In Fremont, like in the Silicon Valley. That's where I'm at. And status, oh God, talk about people and status and the the Los Altos area and all these areas that we sell to, but they have cash, they're cash buyers, obviously upwards of a 10 million and above. And I remember closing just a couple of months ago and status is everything to them. Oh, make sure no paparazzi here. I'm like, I have no control of that, <laughs> you know? So certain things you've got to meet their status quo, you know? Uh, I think it's very important. They expect you to do everything and anything for them. And you got to yeah. live it up to that par. Yeah. It's funny because it does apply to every industry, right? It's like, I've heard it many times, you know, we're a technology company and we push features. Uh, where we really should be pushing the dream of, you know, what a realtor wants to accomplish in the next year. So really great points. And I'm going to, I'm going to go back to you, Robert, for a second here. Um, you know, I know how your, your, your business works and your growth, you're adding people. What's your advice to agents who are struggling to create meaningful connections with prospects that lead to transactions? So a lot of the talk so far has been about how to attract leads. Now, what may have been lost in the different situations is we have to meet the consumer with where they are in their process. Mm -hmm. So if if you're calling cold calling a lead or expired, or if you're calling uh, someone that just registered on your site who has no idea who you are, has doesn't have a care in the world about who you are, or what you offer, trying to take a long approach with them to try to you know, establish a meaningful relationship in a 10 second phone call is probably not probable. And so you have to meet the consumer, the, cl the potential client with where they are in the process. Um, so that's number one. Number two would be what we would kind of call fan fill, find a need, fill a need. So if you're struggling to attract business or clients, it's probably because you're approaching it solely with a unilateral relationship. Stuart, give me your business. Stuart, give me your business. As opposed to making it a reciprocal relationship where I'm also trying to fill a need for you and fill a need. Find a need and fill a need. So if I can figure out what is important to you or something that you need, and I can find a way to make a connection, introduce you to someone. You know, If your kid is trying to get into a school and I know someone on the board, I can make a call to help smooth that pathway. The law of reciprocity means you'll come back around. And so if you're trying to, you have a client, you have someone in your SOI that you're trying to nurture into a business relationship, you should approach it. There's, we have five different ways we try to have a great phone call. And one of the biggest ways is to find a need and fill a need to basically drive that law of reciprocity. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. uh, Janky, same question. <clears throat> What's your advice to agents who are struggling to create those real meaningful connections? And it's not just short term, it could be long term, right? We yeah. all know that the value is could be over seven years. Exactly. And I think, again, we we have convert like we've closed clients. If we look at the data, we've closed clients that have been with us for 937 days. The reason why that number pops up is because we went through this data yesterday with my team. 
how did we do it? It's not only nurturing them by smart plans, guys. It's actually building that connection. We tend to forget we are still in the relationship business. So I go back to falling on relationships, right? We talk about this so much and we forget that it's not transactional based. It is a relationship business. We can have all the AIs in the world. We can have all the automations in the world. But end of the day, it's a connection. You're building that connection with that person. It's a human touch. So for me, at the end of the day, it's always about human touch. I want to make sure who did I do service to today? Who did I do, you know, connect with today? And who did I actually uh, help with their investment, whether it's buy, sell, or invest mm -hmm. in real estate, right? So I think it's very important that we tend to forget all the time that, okay, let's let the AI do the, the work, let the uh, smart plan do the heavy lifting, but at the end of, no, you got to do the heavy lifting work in the human business is what I say. That's not going to change. I don't care who says what. People still need that connection, you guys. Tristan, you've got the space like, okay, I'm thinking, what is she saying? <laughs> you're right. No, I, I just wanted to remind everybody with what you're saying. Um, I'm just going to show the back end of Lofty right here. You've got the ability to build the smart plans and then right. decide how you're going to touch them in between that. I think the value, the value that you offer over a long period of time and that consistency that something like this offers, I think that's that's really what a lot of you are missing. Because if we we take a look at our processes, like Junkie's saying, if we slow down to connect with them and we build something out like this, right? So this is my this is our online lead follow-up, like step by step, like what happens, everything. And then if we make contact, look, we're making sure that we're making more contact, right? Yeah. And then the the key to this here, I'll share it with everybody. Uh, let me grab this and I'll put it into the chat. But the key is, as Junkie's talking about it, what does value look like to the people that you're trying to connect with? That, I think, becomes the biggest question. So for me, if I'm talking to, say, Adam, and Adam, you and I are talking, you came through, you're looking, dude, six years from now, you're like, I don't even know where I'm looking. I'm like, look, Adam, you're from Florida. You're coming into California. Uh, listen, I, I know that you're probably never going to buy it, but if you do, I don't want to spam you. Listen, I, I want to send you homes you actually like. Do you want to be closer to the ocean or up on the mountains? You're like, right. well, I want to be closer to the mountains. I'm like, listen, Adam, what I'll do for you when we hang up, I'm going to send you a quick update as to what it is to move to California. And then as I'm talking to him, I'm going to, I'm going to show you what we do really quick. I'm going to Gamma and I'm just listening to everything he's saying. First, uh, create a presentation for a first time buyer in California. I'm doing this as I'm talking to them. And I go, you know what? Eight's good. I'll, I don't want to do it less cards. Uh, I'll do media. I'll do detailed. Continue. This is how fast it is. We'll be done in about a minute. I like this one. It'll generate it for me. I'm still talking to Adam. I'm like, Adam. All right. So once we hang up, I'm going to text you a, a quick PDF. It's about eight pages long. It'll show you exactly what it is to move to California. And if you have any questions about this, let me know. It's got a little bit of details, a little bit of highlights. I want you to take a look at page four. It kind of has like a pyramid thing, or maybe it's page six. But I'll follow up with you in two days. Is that okay, Adam? You're like, yeah. And now you're texting that to them. You're giving them value. And obviously, you can go through and actually present this whole thing if you ever do. But I just created that in a minute and I'm giving value. And like one of the, yeah. And I like, I like that piece, Tristan, because as you know, um, and we'll talk, we'll, we're going to go into this deeper, but there are lots of changes in the industry, right? There is the permission to contact. There is the presentation tools that are going to be required from parts of the, the transaction and agents need to be prepared for that. So what have you and your teams done differently in light of the changes and the NAR rulings from earlier this year. A lot of talking about clear cooperation and those kind of things. Let's just spend a few minutes on this because I think it's really important that people understand that there is more coming uh, when we think about January and, and, and February. Uh, you want to start, Tristan, or you want me to go to someone else? Yeah, I'll go. Uh, I think the, the number one thing is rem reminding people 
that people aren't stupid. Listen, your consumer isn't stupid, right? They know what's going on. In fact, more educated than a lot of realtors at this point. Like they know exactly. all the places to go look at homes, whether it's Zillow, Realtor.com, Movoto yeah. uh, is one of my favorites. So yeah. yeah, for sure. I'm reminding I'm reminding our agents that our job is to make sure that we are the advisor, we're the expert in this whole process. Because now over the last 2010, 14, 15 years, that ability for the consumer to not be able to search for property, all the details, information is all gone. It's all up to them now. They can they can do whatever they're sending us property. It's our it's our challenge now to be able to say, yeah, you know what? This is what we offer. This is our offer, and this is why we're so important to the process, or right? whatever that looks like for you. And it's different for every agent. So I'm just reminding our agents, guys, this is what we stand for. This is why people are going to hire us, right? And we need to elevate ourselves so that we, in essence, elevate our industry from the ground up from where we're at. And that's what all of these great agents are doing. Yeah, it, it's an interesting conversation for search, for sure. So Lofty as a company, you know, we're technology based, but we look at everything right now from search to settlement, right? And we can help how we can help that consumer experience be better for our realtor clients. Um, Robert, anything to say on this topic um, of where we're going? And, and can you restate the uh, the question? So what have you guys done differently in light of the NAR rulings and the upcoming regulation changes for 2025? Well, the upcoming regulation changes about TCPA? Uh, some of that, absolutely. Uh, I guess I'll leave that for later in the conversation. In regards to the NAR settlement, uh, we basically just took what we were doing up to a whole nother level uh, we operate just everything I've said before in terms of creating different offers, back it up with different value propositions. One of the things that we haven't talked about is charging more, which most agents never even consider. In any other industry you look at, there's segmentation in the market. Products are placed at all different price points. You know, one of the most successful products ever deployed in the automobile industry was came from Porsche. And when they were developing, they had this audacious idea to create uh, an SUV, which was everyone was like, dude, just stay in your lane. You make sports cars. Who's ever going to buy an SUV from Porsche? And so what they did was instead of building the car and then trying to figure out what price point they could sell it for, they went out and did significant market research to establish the price point first and then built the car to fit the price point. And so that's exactly what you need to do. You need to put your price before your product, figure out what you want to charge and then figure out what your clients will value enough to be willing to pay that price. If you do that, you get paid a lot more, which is what our agents do. That's our biggest differentiator. The same amount of time investment, our agents are making twice as much as you guys are probably. That's amazing. That's incredible. Um, Adam, because you're on there, I'm going to ask you that same question, right? Um, what have you done differently um, with regards to the NAR ruling earlier this year? Um, and what are you looking at coming into 2025? Um, there hasn't really been a lot in my world that's changed. Um, thankfully, I had a pretty good mentor and trainer when I first got into real estate six years ago that was very strict on teaching um, transparency and basically treating buyers just like you would a seller. So we do a listing presentation for sellers, but typically a lot of agents don't do those for buyers. Like, why don't, why don't we do that? Right. Um, so a lot of the things haven't really changed as far as process goes. It's more about the content inside the message that's already been there just offers a little bit more of a, um, a clear direction and a little bit better explanation of the options that they have available through their journey. Um, and a lot of it is kind of one of those things, looking at their situation and looking at their concerns with um, applying their goals to that transaction process and then figuring out solutions to their options so they kind of understand. And, you know, we're we're giving them choices and saying, hey, here's here's how this works. Here's your options. This is what could result from each choice. How do you want to like, what do you want to do from here kind of a thing? So that's really, it's it just been having, having more of those conversations just in volume 
and it's kind of nice because you get more practice um, kind of doing the fundamentals and, um, you know, offering that, um, that guidance and advice. Very cool. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to throw this one out to everybody and, and I'll get Janky to respond first, and then we'll kind of spend some time with each of you. So you are all uh, team leaders, right? You have grown teams. You've become very successful. What can team leaders or future team leaders do to support their agents the most right now? That's a great question, Stuart. I love that question because, you know, we as team leaders get too much involved into the daily maybe or far out left or right, whatever you want to call it. We're too much involved with just like um, the big, big, big goals. Yes, you do need to focus on that, no doubt, but stream it down to how are you encouraging and empowering your team? What are you saying on a daily basis to get them motivated, to get them encouraged? Um, a lot of people, a lot of realtors are now falling into the holiday season, right? But this is the time to push it a little harder. So what we're doing is actually we're focusing on not, we finished our plan for 2025, but at the same time, we're trying to do something different to encourage our team members to share certain things like our presentations. Most of our clients here are engineers, right? We're Google, we're Silicon Valley. 99% sure. of them are engineers. So we share something like this with them. Why is it good to buy or sell? We actually do this also, the buyer guide. Now we have these in PDFs. We have them in, you know, all these different uh, variations. But this is what I encourage my, my virtual assistants, my VA team to actually focus on is what more, what kind of content can we add into this to, to create more of a relationship built business. And then another thing we also talk about is giving our team options, giving them more of a breathing space to leverage them enough to empower them to help us grow. And the, at, at the end of the day, when you give that that um, encouragement and empowerment to your team, guess what happens? It increases your business and it's a win-win for everyone around it, right? Around your business. So positivity, affirmations. I actually even do a quick five minute huddle with my uh, VA staff and say, all right, let's go. Let's, let's start with your affirmations. What's the first thing that comes to mind? When you're not in the positive mindset, don't touch the business. Take a minute or two to walk away. So Robert, you're, you are, your, your team is growing. You're, you're doing some amazing things from that side of the business, recruiting top agents, bringing them across. <clears throat> Tell me how you uh, can support these leaders to be more successful, to build their own teams, right? So on the business side of things, um, the number one thing we help them do is double their average commission and add on additional revenue streams. So for every one opportunity, so where we started the conversation is attracting clients. So everything that you think in terms of a conventional funnel and forecasting in real estate, we just try to blow out of the water. And I'll give you an example. So if we, if we capture a lead, we put it through our ISA team and we convert that opportunity. In the past, you would convert it, get paid once, and you would forecast to make X number of dollars based upon what you assume you would make. We make twice as much. We try to get the other side as well. We're also monetizing it on average four times. So as soon as you can get paid four times on every one opportunity you convert, it completely changes the ROI paradigm. And all of a sudden you can afford to pay more for an opportunity, which means you can outcompete the competition. Like, so if those are staggering numbers, man. Like that is crazy. Um, I'd like to hear more about that. Like Maybe go to even a step deeper. I mean, a step a, de a step deeper. I mean, we're our revenue from what I just talked about has more than doubled year over year in a year where we're forecasting about three point eight million sales in the United States. So, wow. yeah, yeah, I mean, our revenue from our ISA program is up over eleven hundred percent because just what I'm talking about: finding an audience, making an offer for them, commanding higher compensation, backing it up with even more value, and then monetizing it multiple times. Amazing. Tristan, thoughts on this one. How do you, what can team leaders or future team leaders do to support their agents the most right now? And you, you dabble in it all. So I want to hear your thoughts on this as well. You're muted. First of all, I agree with Robert and Jonky. That, that is, those are key. I agree. Uh, and I think to just go on top of that as well is 
their mindset only because you know we we manage a big a big community and not only that we work with agents and it's tough out there man like when when somebody goes through not having a transaction for three months they start questioning whether or not this is their business or maybe whether or not it's them and not us right and then it becomes a victim mentality i mean we see we see it everywhere and i think the biggest challenge we have facing agents right now is is the mindset the mindset of well maybe this isn't for me or maybe this is just wrong and look real estate isn't for everyone i know that but i think it's our job as leaders to sit down with everyone individually on our team and and ask or at least have somebody who can sit down with them individually and ask hey but where do you want to be and why is it challenging because you know what the answer will be most of the time it has nothing to do with real estate it's something that's going on internally, some emotional challenge, something that's happening at home or some other thing. And they need help breaking through that. And I think once we take the time to to help them with that, then you start seeing them grow. But it takes a long time. And that's, that's the angle that I think um, I would add. But I agree with the rest. Interesting. Um, if you had someone who approached you and said, hey, I really want to build a team out, right? You've got the broker and then you've got team leaders. What would you say to that? What advice would you give to someone who is saying, I want to go down the path of a team. We know how important teams are going to be over the next five years or longer, right? People are starting to gravitate more to that. What would you just say to someone who came to me? You know, I had a conversation with someone recently, a this very thing. I said, well, make sure you're picking the right people underneath you, but also give them incentive that they know what that when they're ready, they're going to start being able to build their own team out. What are your thoughts around that? What kind of advice would you give someone who's going to build a team out? Hands down, join a team first, and it has to be a productive team. So I'd interview probably three or four teams locally, see which one matches the culture that you like, and then stay there for a few years. Because the opposite is saying, I want to start a team buying all this stuff, not knowing what the hell to do, burning out of the business and saying real estate sucks, teams suck, online leads suck, everything sucks, <laughs> right? And so you've got to you've got to be that apprentice for a few years. And this is a few you seven, eight years, then say, got it. I understand. And go in and say, Robert, I listen, I want to join your team. I love it. I'd I'd be blessed to be on your team. My goal eight nine years from now is to start my own team. So I may ask questions along the line just to get to understand the back end of this. Is that okay with you? And just putting it up there. And, and I think that is the right way. Robert, advice think, for someone who wants to build a team. I think Tristan's advice was very good and I would preface it or underscore to pick the right team. And what right team means to me is one that's actually run like a real business because the majority of teams out there are just the result of a rainmaker that just decided the next step in their progression was to have other agents work with them. It's well, not it's a built by business. Well, and the and new so, financial model kind of pushes people towards that, right? With some of the larger organizations, let's be honest, right? Um, incentive on that side. Sure, yeah. I mean, it is. there is no promotion to like a senior real estate agent. So the next line in the progression is to have <laughs> other agents working under you. All I'm, I'm not saying that's wrong. All I'm saying is before you actually start a team, treat it like a real business, have a real business plan, have an avatar for the agents that are going to be a fit for your culture, have your culture written down, have your standards and operating procedures already established. And then ultimately, like we talked about before, figure out what clients you're trying to serve, how you're going to try to serve them and how you're going to serve them in a, in a way that's better than the competition, as opposed to just try, trying to play the same game as everyone else and doing it for a little bit less. So that would be my advice is actually to treat it like a real business before you jump in and start shelling out money. Jenki, same question for you. So you are a master of teams. Uh, let's hear your thoughts around what advice you'd give someone. Let's say a team member today, comes to you and says, you know, Janky, you've been awesome for me, uh, but I want to start my own team underneath you. What advice would you give them? I would definitely agree with Tristan and Robert. I actually wrote my notes down, treat it like a business. I think a lot of us forget 
we tend to take our, <clears throat> excuse me, our finances or whatever we've made in terms of commission, and we just say, okay, this is leisure money. I've made that mistake, you know, a lot of times before in the past. I never treated my business as a true business. What am I gaining out of it? What am I losing out of it? Where's my ROI? I have to understand, or a team leader needs to understand, you need to treat it like a business, right? And focus in on the standards, the processes, the goals, the vision. Um, I remember talking to Tristan once and he says, what is your vision? What are your big goals? You know, what are your uh, smaller goals that you want to achieve? So those things are very important. And I think that's something that our real estate industry as a whole needs to understand that treat it like a business. Your entrepreneurs at the end of the day. Gotcha. 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 That, that's, that's a really good answer from you guys. I really appreciate the honesty and really pushing it out there with some passion. A couple of things really up, Stuart, um, everyone that's listening in two things. One, I need to know if you're gaining value from this, just give me a yes or, or a no, like tell us, tell us what you want to talk, what you, where you want us to see uh, us go in the next two hours, right? Give us a yes. No. Okay. Got it. Yes. So, uh, so we've got like 10 minutes left this Perfect. Group, uh, before we switch over. And the next thing really quick, there is a discount for Lofty. So I know it came through a few times. Uh, I've seen it, right? So Stu, uh, can you tell us really quick what that is or should we just put the link in there? Yeah, uh, Kendra will put the link in and okay. she's Perfect. got all the information. But you know, you're, that's a perfect lead in for me, uh, Tristan. We've got like 10 minutes left. If I didn't talk about technology as a technologist, uh, I'd get shot uh, by someone uh, on my team. So, you know, one of the big issues is agents sometimes are hesitant to invest in technology, but not only invest in technology, but adopt technology. What would, what would, be, what would you say to those people um, on how valuable technology has to be in building your business. And we know about AI and we know about a lot of the features and functionality that are being built out to take on a lot of the heavy lifting for realtors. I, I'd like to hear your opinion on this. And then I'm going to ask you a very specific question about it. Who are you going to first? You're up. Okay. Uh, tech. Yeah, dude, come on. Like tech allows us to build, I can build smart plans now which I think Adam may talk about in the next session, but I can build smart plans on Claude or ChatGPT or Gemini. And, and I can make a little gem on Gemini and be like, hey, you are now the person or the AI that creates uh, smart plans for me for past clients, boom. And I can grab those, right? Exactly where I went before on Lofty and then upload those there and then start creating my past client one and then for closings and then for current buyer i can do everything now and it's because of these tools that are intertwining somebody was asking about ai like listen do you guys have ai i'm like yeah lofty's got built-in ai and it's real real machine learning and who knows where they're going with that next but the point is technology has become a really key piece for for agents to be able to do a lot more than they were doing before and here's the one thing that I'll transition to whoever you want. The one thing that I think will happen in the next, I don't know, three, four years, depending on how fast we accelerate with AI and tech, we're going to start seeing now more mega agents, not just mega teams, be able to do a lot more as a single mega agent with a massive support staff that's now people, AI and tech to be able to achieve things that that a team would normally have to achieve years ago or currently. And we're not there yet, but it's going to happen, right? So awesome, yeah, tech Robert, let's hear your thoughts on tech and the value of it uh, and how to get people to adopt it. Those are two different questions. So the average brokerage has about 12 different pieces of technology, which in and of itself is a problem for adoption. So if you can whittle that down to one or two pieces of technology and then drive adoption to those two, and that's one of the biggest reasons why Lofty has been so impactful for us is because we fundamentally have reduced down. In fact, we just eliminated another piece of technology last week. And so Lofty is not a CRM. It's a full operating system. It does everything for us from our front end all the way through closing and our back end and vice versa and you know, repeat, rinse and repeat. 
So that, that would be the biggest difference is now we say, hey, agents in our organization, all you have to use is this one piece of technology, learn it really well. And we're very good at training how, how to use it. Um, now I'll, I'll piggyback on one thing. So Harvard Business Review actually did a study. This was probably 15 years ago now where it looked at, this was early on in the development of all different CRM technologies and it looked across all different sales industries. And it basically uh, labeled different CRM technologies as high tech, medium tech, and low tech, and then looked at the performance on those platforms. And what they found was the complexity of the technology did not correlate with results. They found that the CRM that you use is actually the one that gets the results. The difference is Lofty has a much higher ceiling and a much higher efficiency because instead of having to plug and connect different technologies and work on different platforms that are separate databases, if you work it, if you use it properly, your ceiling is much higher. I guess the Michael Jordan quote, what did he say? He said the the roof is the, the ceiling or something. <laughs> Do you know that one? Yeah. <laughs> when he, when I don't know what exactly. Yeah. I'll look it up. I always like the one from him where he says, I missed 90% of the opportunities I took. And he's still the leading scorer of, you know, forever uh, and will never be passed from my opinion. Anyway, uh, he mentions, Janky, he meant, uh, your he shot mentions, at this one. Go ahead, Robert. What, what did he say real quick? I want to hear he it. He meant to say the sky is the limit, but instead he yeah, said the, I was gonna the, say ceiling, that. the ceiling is the, the limit. The ceiling is the roof. That's what he said. Oh, uh, <laughs> the ceiling is the roof. Yeah, I was going to say something of that sort, but I'm like, oh, I don't want to look. Okay. I really want to say this. I love, love, love Lofty. Hey guys, I don't get paid for saying this. I always say that on my on my posts. I don't get paid for anything, but I love, I've used so many damn CRMs, guys. And I don't know what it is with Lofty that I click so well with it. And I, I know what it is. It's my smart plans. It's my yeah, I can I can actually put my whatever I have in here on my smart plan and relate it, you know, send it out to my clients. That's what I love. I also love my VA team. Guys, leverage is key part of your business. You get 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 real with it. When you're at a certain level that you feel comfortable, leverage that piece out. My smart plans, editing of that, I don't do it. I have my team do it. And then, of course, you know, I go back and forth. What's in my head? I put it down. Another thing I love is the AI. You guys, mass texting, we just got 125 responses just last night, sending it out to maybe 500 people. 400 people in our database and we got amazing results so use that technology that lofty already has in place like robert said it's not only a crm it's end to end it's everything you need um and again i'm not just I, we don't get paid for this but we're telling you our results what we found valuable in this process so lofty plus a va team for leverage equals success with growth and relationships that's all i gotta say that is fantastic. So we've got a few minutes left. I'm going to ask you all for one quick positive statement about 2025. Janky, lead the way. Build relationships? <laughs> I, 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 I don't know. That's too dear to me. I mean, I think 2025 is going to be an amazing year. If only you stay focused, consistent, and know what you want in your goals, right? Set it to the Robert. three. Well, go for it. Robert, positive statement about 2025. You guys are killing it. I want to hear a good one. You're seven times more likely to become a multimillionaire in a down market than in a big one, than a good one. So I would thrive on this opportunity. In fact, like we're chomping at the bit. And so my advice would be for you to do less, not more. Do, do better. Pick one thing, do it better, then do more of it. And when you can't do any more of it, then consider new. But you should be doing at least a million of GCI before you consider new if you really focus better, more than new. Awesome. Tristan, you're the man. Uh, I want to hear your positive thoughts for 2025. I know I have mine. You guys have all heard them. Uh, let's hear it. And then we can do the draw. Yeah, for me, it's, it's pretty easy. Anytime I hear more people become victims of them themselves, I see a bigger opportunity and it's right now. Look, we have the biggest opportunity. We have a headway. The next six months are going to be the best six months of your life if you just decide that this business is for you. Awesome. Uh, you want to pick someone? You want to go down the list? and Yeah, let's go, guys. I need a. I need you to type in, in the chat. We're going to, this is for the giveaway of the swag bag. And what's in the swag bag, Stuart? A, 
bunch of great lofty stuff. Hats, okay. t-shirts, pens, cool stuff. the whole deal. I need, I need the word lofty in the chat. And from the word lofty, oh damn, that was fast. From the word <laughs> lofty, we're gonna pick, we're gonna pick one random person in the next 10 seconds. Uh here we go. And for those asking about more technical stuff, yeah, Adam is going to get on here and talk about the technical stuff. He's always really good at that. And if you're looking to hire him, obviously, as well. Uh, in the meantime, uh, once we end this one, Robert, Jonky, you're going to have to put in your emails to see how people can get a hold of you if they have questions, whether they want to join your team or just have questions specifically. Okay, here we go. Damn, it's still going. Let me pick one random one. I'm going to scroll through. I won. How did I win? I don't even know. Shit. Okay. Um, let's go with Linda Matthews. Woo. Linda, you are the winner for this round. We still have to give another swag bag away and an Apple Watch. But this one's for the swag bag. Linda, I need you to do me a favor. At the bottom, I need you to put or just message me in here and just give us your email address and your phone number just in case... We can't get a hold of you in one, and then we will follow up with you on that. Congratulations. So, guys, I just want to say uh, I think that was a really good first hour um, of the virtual summit uh, this year. I think it was great. I really appreciate what you guys had to offer. Uh, and I'm going to pass things off to Tristan now to take it to the next session. Thank you so much for everything. Thank you. Thanks, uh, and Robert uh, and Junkie, if you want to put your email address there, if people have questions. I know Robert and Junkie have a lot of opportunities, whether it's the team or anything else. Uh, they're absolutely amazing. I'll drop so it in can... again. Thanks, buddy. Appreciate awesome. you. And Junkie, do the same. Thanks, Junkie. Thanks, Stu. Thank you, guys. All right. Let's, uh, let's transition over. And I've got, first of all, Adam and Brady. Welcome. I'm putting into the host section uh, Linda's information so we can grab that just in case we need that. And let's talk about, well, Brady, nobody knows who you are right now. Who are you? What do you do? Go. Hey, guys. Uh, quick intro here. My, my name is Brady Mosk. I'm the sales director of Lofty. Um, I've been with the company now about six years, uh, started as a frontline account executive and I've slowly but surely worked my way through the organization. And now I have the pleasure of uh, helping the sales team advance their career and continue to work and serve the wonderful clients that we have and anybody that's interested in exploring Lofty and, and leveraging our platform to ultimately build relationships, attract more clients and, uh, and drive more revenue. So I'm really, really happy to be here. What an incredible first session. I was taking notes over here. I hope everybody else was too. Well, that was good. That was good. I like. Thanks for being on, Brady. And nice to see you again too. As always. And, and, and good thing you're not sick, dude. Don't get sick. Don't get sick. <laughs> um, Adam, what should we expect in this round with you and Brady since you've already introduced yourself? Um, we're going to be talking about a few different things here. Uh, we're going to be talking about um, market snapshots, property alerts, and market reports. We're going to be talking about the buyer matching uh, lead, um, uh, buyer matching lead in the listing tool, and uh, geo farming. So, basically, one of the things that I'd like people to understand is it's been said a few times that Lofty isn't just a CRM. I look at I look at Lofty as a marketing and productivity platform where you can basically do everything for your real estate business from curiosity to close. So we're going to talk about some um, things that are probably underutilized that should be implemented in your 2025 uh, business plan if you already haven't and show you how you can use them in Lofty. I love that. Thanks, Adam. All right, Brady, where do you want to take us first? You know, I would, uh, I'm okay, good. I was just going to ask if I could get access to share my screen. So let's go ahead and, and start off there just by getting everybody's eyes here on the Lofty platform. And and before I just dive in and, and start talking about those, those features that we often think don't get quite enough love and attention, the reason why we're talking about these features, it, it's directly correlated some of the, to some of the biggest points that I heard over the, the previous session. And the first thing I think is really worth pointing out is this question to challenge our audience of what we're doing to attract people to us, to our brand, to our business, to our websites, 
how are we drawing in those eyes, those clicks, those views, that that traffic, right? And that dovetails quite nicely into my philosophy of Lofty, which is we're an engine to drive more traffic into your business, right? We're an engine to help capture that traffic and those leads for you. AI is a major factor in that capture process. From there, we then think about how we can empower agents to follow up automatically, effectively, and at the right time. And by combining those three factors, you can help maximize your agent productivity, your, your revenue output, and that's how every year in the future becomes better than every year you, you've had thus far. So that's just how I wanted to set the table here in terms of the way that I approach Lofty and that, and that formula for success. Attract folks in, capture that momentum, follow up with them aggressively, and, and that's what ultimately increases your conversion rates. So the, the very first place that I would start in terms of a, a feature in our system that I think everybody should be leveraging more effectively is about how to attract more eyes and views and traffic into your system. And that's gonna be done over here in the Lofty People tab. This is the central hub of our database, guys. So if you're not using Lofty, this is what it looks like when you sign into your system and you see your entire database at a bird's eye view. But to drill down into this specific segment, I wanted to pop into uh, one of our lead records. And here we have John as, as somebody that we're, we're trying to do business with. And he's been identified as a seller. And you know we talked a lot about smart plans, right? We talked a lot about drip campaigns and, and AI, but the first specific feature that I really wanted to point out is the ability to help solve the question, why is now a good time to sell? You know, and, and where we really bring that to light is over in the lofty engagement section where we integrate with your MLS and we bring that MLS data right to your fingertips. And then we push that MLS data out, out to your clients in the form of property alerts. But the one I really wanted to point out was a market snapshot. So a market snapshot within lofty is an automatic email from you that's branded to you. It's got all your color schemes and logos and all the fun stuff that helps bring you to life. But the intent of a market snapshot in Lofty is to use your sold data in your MLS to proactively educate your clients as to what's hitting the market in their neighborhood or in their desired neighborhood, right? Because you can set up a snapshot to encapsulate not just where they live now, but their future state, where they want to go and where they want to call home next. So one of the things I heard in, in the previous session was that idea of attraction and, and also about how to identify that now's a good time to sell. And leveraging sold information, I think, is a powerful way to help close the gap and answer that question. So, um, you know, Adam, I, I understand you've been using the Lofty system and you're big on, on our smart plans, but what are your thoughts on market snapshots and how we can help leverage that sold data to engage our sellers and potentially our past clients as well? So I like the snapshots um, quite a bit. I use them for buyers and seller leads. And I use them a little bit differently as far as a mindset goes. It, it's the same information, pretty similar settings. For a seller lead, it's about the reality of what the market is is doing like currently. It's not like, like market reports are kind of like what happened last month. This is kind of like, this is what happened in the last you know week or two weeks. So we're following the trends in a shorter amount of time instead of longer period of time. So it's more about that when they, when they see changes, when they get the information and they see how quickly things change from week to week, that really helps drive home uh, some of the things that we use as talking points in our conversations. Um, for buyers, it, it's a lot of the thing where if they are kind of on the fence like a lot of times they're just they have like that imposter syndrome like i can't believe we're pre-approved we're going to be homeowners and they start seeing a lot of the things that like oh i was really in love with that house it's like well you didn't do a showing request you didn't see the property you didn't do anything and you lost out on that so like this is a thing like you can't play games in this market this is like you're, you're playing for keeps kind of a thing um so having the same tools and using them with a little bit different mindset depending on what lead type you're dealing with can help you um uh, kind of reiterate what you're telling them as far as market and process and things like that go. And those are really, really helpful uh, ways to use this in, in Lofty. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Tristan, what are your thoughts on leverage and sold data here to engage both buyers and sellers? Is this a strategy that you and your team are using? It's the long-term strategy, man. I think one, one thing that we've noticed is we have, I mean, I've been in real estate since 
04 and we started using tech in 07, right? So you see some of our leads that have a, a, a registration date of a long time ago because you know they've been in our system for a long time. And the one thing that I've noticed is that they keep on opening certain emails, like emails, dude, not text, not emails. They keep on opening property emails, CMAs. And then when I try to call them, they don't pick up and they don't text me back, but they keep on opening the emails. And guess what happens over a long period of time? They finally call back. And this, this just happened to us with one of our agents, Luis. They just called him back. He said, hey, Luis, listen, thank you so much for your emails, your calls, your updates. We're, we're thinking now it might be ready to, to sell our home. This is like years into it, man. And so we love this because it stays in contact with people, with what they really, 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 really want. Think about what, what made Zillow popular and why Zillow is still popular. It's their estimate. That's what it was, right? What do people want? They want to know what their properties are worth. They want to see property. It's not spam to them. It's valuable. That's why that's important, man. I'm so glad that you you brought up that point uh, because as, as valid and as important as a smart plan is for staying top of mind with someone, 90% of the engagement that you are going to get on your website derives from property alerts and market snapshots. It, people want to look at homes, right? As good as it is to send a text message on somebody's birthday and a wedding anniversary or a pet's birthday, right? That's all great stuff. That's, that's a way to make people feel good, right? But to yeah. provide education and real value, we need to show them homes, both what's coming on the market and what's active on the market. And that's why we make these property alerts automatic and seamless but also the other side of the equation of what is the inventory actually looking like that's turning over daily, weekly, and, and monthly. Uh, and, and by the way, guys, I just want to point out that these snapshots, these property alerts are incredibly easy to set up. It should take you no more than 30 seconds unless it's a very hyper-specific search that you're customizing on a deep level. But plug in the neighborhood where somebody wants to call home or, or their current neighborhood. Maybe refine it a little bit and then you can choose, you know, to Adam's point, you can choose your level of proactivity with this automation. If you want to show up daily in somebody's inbox and they're really, really hot, great way to do so, right? If you wanted to really be quick. a little less aggressive, go ahead. Brady, uh, there are going to be a lot of people who lose you in certain things or they have questions, like sure. questions about up things. When you have a chance after you're done through this, could you show them where they could go to have like a, a small tutorial or a process shown to them within Lofty? Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, I, I actually think it might make sense just to do a quick little peek at that right now. Um, anytime you have questions about leveraging our platform, anytime you'd like to learn more, your best friend is going to be this little question mark shaped icon in the upper right hand. corner. You know, one of the easiest things to do is jump into our show me how feature. This is where we walk you through step-by-step step about how to do specific things, maybe as simple as importing a lead or just adding a new relationship into your database. It'll actually gray out your screen and force you to follow along and click through the path to develop that muscle memory. So this would be a, a really, really good place to start. I also think that our learning center would be a really valuable resource for anyone at any point in their life cycle with us. If you've been on board with Lofty for five years, right, you may be inclined to focus in on our feature updates. What's new and improved that's coming around the corner and that we released earlier this week, right? If you're brand new to, on, to our Lofty system, jump into our agent onboarding. We run live scheduled webinars multiple times a day, five days a week. Everyone is encouraged to attend those webinars as much as they'd like, whenever you'd like. So please tap into those resources in addition to just doing something as simple as calling out to us, right? We've got a phone number you can reach out to. You can download our mobile app. You can always submit a ticket to our support team. There are many, many ways that you can get consume resources and educate yourself in addition to reaching out to our support team and having us hop on a call and help show you the way. Hope that helps. Perfect. That helps a lot. Beautiful. Beautiful.
Do we have any other thoughts on the MLS automations, property alerts, or market snapshots, or should we hop over to that next topic? I would say one of the things over. I see kind of pointing out and uh, coming up in a in a little bit here is um, uh, regarding smart plans and these things and also frequencies. So very quickly, smart plans are completely different than uh, property alerts, snapshots, market reports. They're separate things. They both go out automatically, but they cannot be incorporated into smart plans. That's a whole whole different section there. Um, the other. The other question regarding or questions regarding frequency, um, everybody does like there is no right or wrong way to do it. Um, my my key saying is whatever fits your brand and your business, right? So in my system, I use snapshots by default is set biweekly. So basically every two weeks to go out. And that's just for new leads because in my system, I track down the average uh, conversion time or what I call nurturing time. Uh, so I know about when they're going to uh, finally convert into a client and I match my frequency based on that reality. Um, if you don't know, I think every other week is a good place to start. If you're in a little bit more fast moving market where you actually have a decent amount of inventory, we have enough to populate a report weekly, then that may be more appropriate for your market. Um, the market reports are usually monthly. You can do it for longer periods, but I just set that for monthly. Uh, property alerts, I set that no more than three or four days a week. And I'll, I'll play around back and forth with that three or four days, depending on my mood. Um, back when I was in Wisconsin, um, we have harsh winters there. So things really slow down. So I'm going to make that maybe two or three days. But then come March, when it starts to kind of warm up and spring, spring starts to happen, I'm pushing more three to four days a week because that's just what they need. Um, the peak of summer, I might do instant uh, for, for some people, but, you know, any of those options are, are going to be a good start to get you a good frequency where you're going to stay in the peripheral and, and, and kind of, you know, moving in the front of their focus. And you're not going to like bombard them and just get like right up in their face kind of a thing. That's absolutely what you don't want. So be careful about this, like, you know, instant things. Like if, if they're a client and you're actually like showing homes and, and listing houses, sure. Instant may be appropriate timing, but if they're further away in the process than being an actual working in person client, just take a step back and match match the frequency to their motivation and state of readiness. You know, I'd only add to that and say that with Lofty, you should have complete transparency of, you know, with, with the point that Tristan made of he's had leads in his database for years. And all of a sudden now, maybe one is starting to virtually raise their hand or starting to display some of that intent. What I would encourage everybody to use is, is filter their Lofty system by website visitors. And if you notice that somebody is in your database for, you know, four years and they've never been on the site, but all of a sudden they're visiting that your, your website, you're going to find that these are the folks that are potentially worth at least analyzing how frequently they're receiving those snapshots, those market reports, and those property alerts. So you can leverage some of the filters in our system to see who you should up the ante on and maybe the vice versa as well. If folks are not opening your emails as much anymore, maybe they put their research process on hold, their search process. So just wanted to, to point out how transparent it should be for you to see the change in your behaviors of your database when you're managing it here through Lofty. Yeah, yeah opportunities and especially, can, can you show them the activity screen in the reporting section real quick? Absolutely. So one of the things, so if you click on reporting on the top and then bottom left, you're going to see activities clicking that link. This is one of the more important things that is definitely underutilized. A lot of agents and, and users don't know that this um, is in the system here. This is the weekly activities of anything from website activities up to email opens and things like that. Opportunity, you know, Ryan Davis requested a home evaluation. Guess what? That's somebody that's looking to run the numbers and possibly sell their property. So that's an opportunity that you need to take advantage of and, and reach out to them and figure out again, how, you know, what they need and how, what you offer is, is something that can potentially help them. Um, this here will also let you know your most active leads and this should be coincided with maybe you don't have, maybe you have somebody in your nurturing or your attempting contact pipeline 
And all of a sudden you see, oh, geez, you know, Brian's on there. And where did he come from? I have never seen his name before. Well, he's one of your active leads this week, most active leads this week. You should probably reach out to Brian and see what he's up to. And you can click on the lead profile and look at his activity and then decide what, if any, action to take. So that's a, that's definitely something there. And you say, oh, geez, he's been blowing this up with a bunch of shoring requests and saving properties and things. And I don't even have him on any engagements. Well, like that, that's, that's, that's enough. That's a problem, you know? So using that in conjunction with the follow-up tools, like smart plans, like the, the property related mm -hmm. um, emails really, really take advantage of those opportunities. That's, that's where, that's where the bread and butter is right there. Yeah. Good point. I like that. I, don't, I couldn't have said that better myself. The way I describe that function in our reporting is this is the place where agents should start their day. If you're grabbing a cup of coffee, you sit down in front of Lofty and you don't know what to do, instead of just signing into your database and looking at a list of potential clients, let's just take a laser-like focus and say, who are the people that I should follow up with first? I like working hot leads. Everybody does. This is a good way to separate those from anybody else in your group. So great call. And this is this this here is actually really good that you mentioned the coffee. That's literally my coffee routine is first cup of coffee in the morning. I come on my activity screen and I have a rule with myself. I've, the five years I've been using Lofty, I do not leave this page unless until my coffee is done. So however fast or slow I drink it, I need to study this page. And this is where I start my day in Lofty. Um, huh. And the other thing, too, is, um, you know, the, these are also reflected on your opportunities notifications as well. But a lot of times I think what what's really good about this is you may not have a lead in the database that shows up on that that very active lead panel on the right hand side. But what's advantageous about using this and putting this into your daily routine is you get to see the trending leads before they even show up later on in in certain pipelines or certain opportunities, because if you have somebody that like, let's say, you know, um, yeah, Ryan Davis there. And like, I didn't even know he was in my database. And all of a sudden he's like requesting home valuations. He's opening emails. He's doing a whole bunch of searches. Well, that's a lot of website activity. That's going to be somebody that's going to likely convert to a client sooner. And if I didn't see that on this page, I'm being reactive instead of proactive. So this is, this is helpful in many ways. Yeah, that, that's very true, man. Can we also, I'm going to add two questions that were asked in the chat only because they're great questions for others to learn from. When you go back to the people screen where it shows all your leads, Brady, mm -hmm. the question was, well, how do you know who to reach out to, right? And so for us, we want to categorize them as last visits, right? That's what we typically do. And we start backwards, meaning the one that has visited the most recent is the one we're going to call right now and then work backwards 24 hours if it's been 24 hours since we reached out to the last, right? Can you showcase how we would organize those on this screen if that were the case? Absolutely. You know, the what I would try and do there is, again, just come over and, and apply that filter. Let me remove this so I can start back over. So when you first sign into your system, you're going to see every lead in your database. I'm looking at 3,700 folks. That's overwhelming, right? So to provide clarity, you can come over and just type in the word website. That'll bring up your last website visitors, take you down to that particular filter in Lofty. Let's look at everybody that's visited in a specific time frame, or you can customize that time frame as well. But let's just check out everybody that's been active on our site in the last seven days. And then we can look at our communication to see if we called them, have we emailed them, have we texted them in the last few days? And if not, those are the folks to prioritize. Yeah, that's it. And that's where we would start. And then once you talk to them, you know, the, the process is this. It may sound aggressive to some of you, but we've been working online, line, online leads for a long time. And here's the key. The key is you're going to call Ryan. I'm going to call Ryan Davis. If Ryan doesn't pick up in three calls, I'm going to give him a call again. I'm not even going to leave a message. I'm going to call him again within about 20 seconds. If he doesn't pick up again, then I'm going to hang up and I'm going to text him. And I'm going to say, hey, Ryan, I just tried calling you. This is by text. I just tried calling you. Sorry, I missed you. Are you? And then I look at what he's looking at area-wise, what he's looked at. I say, Harry, are you only looking for a townhome or are you also looking for a house? Question mark. 
And then I grab that and I put it in the email format. Everything that's there, like green, light blue, purple, right? Or light purple. And then email, subject line. Hey, Ryan, I just tried calling you. Sorry, I missed you. Then in the body, Ryan, uh, I just tried calling you, but I want to make sure we're sending you the right homes. Listen, are you looking for a townhome or a house? Send it through. Dude, Michael Green looks a lot like The Rock. It's crazy. Similar, <laughs> similarities. I don't know what you're talking about, Tristan. That's completely <laughs> uh, no resemblance whatsoever. That's so funny. <laughs> And then while I'm, if I'm Adam and I'm sitting here for the next hour, an hour and a half and calling until my coffee's done, then I'm also nudge texting them 15, 20 minutes later. So I'm going to come back to Ryan when I get to like call number seven. It's been like 15 minutes. I'm going to nudge text Ryan and be like, hey, Ryan, let me know. And this is what we do all day. It's so freaking boring. But this is where the money is. This is getting every time. Isn't boring, I'll tell you that. <laughs> what isn't what isn't boring? I missed it. I said getting paid from this isn't oh. boring at all, though. <laughs> oh, <laughs> it's 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 the boring. the process sucks. The result is amazing, right? <laughs> so true, man. That's so true. You know, on that note, I'd be remiss if I didn't point out that you know when we think about calling and texting and emailing, Lofty is also a nice tool for behavior based analytics. So you could come down and look at Ryan and say, and this is another seldom feature. This wasn't on my list, but it is worth pointing out. Go down to that lead score and click on that blue analysis button on your leads records. And let's see why Ryan is such a hot lead at a high level. And then let's mm -hmm. drill, drill down into Ryan's website activities. Well, he hasn't been too active on our site yet, but we can also see if he's going to connect with us via a phone call or if he's going to open and respond to our emails or if he's more responsive via text message. So you guys should know at a glance here with your active leads, whether this person prefers receiving calls over emails, over text, do them all, right? But specialize in the communication that this particular lead prefers to be contact. Yeah. All right, let's move on to the next, I, I believe is another really powerful feature in our system. And it actually ties in something that I heard from Janky earlier in our call, which is the element of a human touch. There is no better feeling than connecting with someone in a genuine, authentic, and helpful way. How I would think about accomplishing this in Lofty is, you know, one of the other places that I always say that an agent should start their day is by jumping into this listings tab within the Lofty CRM. This should give you clarity on every listing that's been in your MLS. You can also, of course, drill down and see the listings that fellow team members in your brokerage or on your team have on the market and be able to manage your, your own inventory here in a, in a bunch of different ways. But the example that I wanted to point out would be jumping into your, your listings tab here and then coming over and seeing all the, the newest listings that have hit the market maybe since the last time that you signed in or even more specifically, let's go back and look at everybody that's now back on market. And the feature that I think everybody could leverage a little bit more is right over here and it's called match buyers. You know, I like to think about this like reverse prospecting. Here's another example of artificial intelligence within our system. What Lofty's doing with buyer matching and reverse prospecting is we're looking at the price point, the location, the square footage, the beds, the baths, the elements of these properties. And then we're scraping that criteria across the leads that you have in your database. What we're trying to do is automatically find connectivity between the buyers you have in your system and the inventory that's available online. The intent is it reduces the mental gymnastics of who should I be sending this property to, right? So with one click, you could jump in and see the six buyers that are a good potential fit for that home that's now back on market. We don't just show you why they're, or who's a good fit. We also show you why they're a good fit. What has Dwin been, been searching for and why is this person a good fit? Why is Jamie a good fit for that home that's now back on market? But where I wanted to go with the personal touch is being able to do something like grab all six of these leads and then send out a text message. Instead of a property alert that's delivered via email automatically, let's follow that up, you know, to, to uh, uh, you know, to Tristan's point here a few minutes ago about following up with that text message, let's also follow up that property alert with the text message that we're putting in here and we're making that manual touch and that manual tip in order to present this listing via text in addition to via email. And by the way, guys, if you ever want help rewriting that email, well, this is where chat GPT and AI is built into Lofty. So you can hit that button and have that text get improved and edited and personalized using, using AI. So 
Um, Adam, is this something that you spend a lot of time in? I do. And um, one of the other things, if you can close this out and then go back to that list of buyers, I want to point something out here that I think people should pay attention to. So one of the, I look at criteria, right? It's, it's, I want data because I can take a direction with it. So what stands out to me looking at this information here on the screen is I'm going to reach out individually to Jamie and I'm going to group everybody else uh, together. The reason I'm selecting Jamie is because the big piece of information here isn't so much that um, she is a um, you know person with five match criteria, which is a good number, but the only one in this list here that engaged. With this being a back on market, and they looked at this back in early September, well, it's a new lead, which means probably just haven't connected, but maybe I can reach out to her individually uh, with a text, with an email, maybe do a bomb bomb or a dub video in the email, follow up with the text and um, engage both ways to put this property back in front and say, hey, you know, this is me. I got a notification. I always use the excuse notification so I don't sound like I'm stalking them. Got a notification notification that you checked out this property. I noticed it came back on market. Do you have interest or were you just looking to see uh, interior decoration ideas like HDTV? Right. Like what, what are you doing looking at this property? Is it something you're interested in? Is it something you think is trash or are you just kind of browsing in, in your board? Right. This is an engagement opportunity from the buyer match column on the listing management page that will allow me to humanize technology. I'm humanizing Lofty by manually reaching out to this contact and figuring out how I can help fulfill the needs that uh, he or she may have. So that's what stands out to me. And I would spend extra time on somebody that has an engagement with a particular matched property like this and then deal with everybody else. So it's kind of like, I'm not, I'm not like not touching everybody else. It's I'm prioritizing the people that should be prioritized. And then st stage two is the people that have less priority um, in there. I love that I love specialization. That's a great point. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a question for either of you. And it's a good question only because I want to showcase it. And I don't even know if you were going there. Okay. But here we go. Here's the question. Uh, thanks for the great info. Joe, thanks for the great question. Uh, why are all the leads coming into my lofty CRM being designated by the AI CRM as a seller lead? Even though most are obviously buyer leads, the AI treats every lead as a prospective seller, even though the prospect is looking to buy houses. So, that gives us the opportunity to show what the AI is and how we can change that and allocate it. That's why I wanted to show it. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, well, first off, the the piece that comes to mind for me is potentially how those leads are entering the system, right? If they're entering from your home valuation tool over on your lofty website, those folks would be coming in as a uh, as a seller. And that's why the AI may identify. So I, I, don't, I don't think that that would apply to 100% of uh, the folks that are entering your database, right? A lot of them are probably being captured by listings. But uh, as our AI is engaging with folks across the website, the conversation that's happening here with our AI assistant on site could prompt the AI to say, wow, this person could potentially be thinking about listing at home. So um, that may be one that we want to we wanna take a, a look at from a tech perspective, but just some insights of why our AI could designate it just based on the conversation or how they actually entered our funnel. Adam may have a different approach to that. That Yeah, that was, that was my only thought is that they're coming in from the web chat and depending on the type of conversation it's having will uh, determine the lead type. Typically, if you're doing any lead generation, like you're running ads, pushing them to your um, you know listings pages and things like that, they're going to be a buyer lead. That's really the only situation I can see where the AI assistant would determine the lead type is through that website chat. Any other type of engagement is going to be based on the marketing and whatever tool you have on the uh, on the Lofty website or landing page. One of the things especially that I would look at is if you're using a landing page, go in the mm -hmm. landing page settings and make sure that the lead type setting is correct and fits the uh, type of That's marketing what I was you're doing. Thinking. It's really overlooked. And I mean, it's, I mean, it's, you know, if that, if that's the case, like, don't feel bad, like 
everybody makes mistakes that everybody there, there's so many things i've been using this darn thing for over five years and i still leave filters on and give myself a heart attack once a week because i think my database is gone <laughs> when i'm just a fool and forgot to reset the filter so you do the it, same thing happens, i do man where yeah. is everything it's so yeah. funny uh brian what do you think my, my dad's been driving six shift for like 60 years and he snubs it sometimes like it happens <laughs> you know like it's fine true. that's true brian thoughts really quick Wait, you're muted. It doesn't look like you're muted, but you're muted. So it might be an audio issue. Can you hear me now? Yep, there you go. Hi, Adam. How's it going? How, Brady? Hey, hey Brady, man. So listening to this, I really want to not pigeonhole just there's either or. Everybody that's a homeowner is a seller and a buyer. They got to buy something somewhere when they sell. So if you treat the mentality that they have to sell or that we even, they're a homeowner. And one of the things that we'll be doing as we go forward, and I'll talk about on our track, is to identify homeowners early in the stage of the process so you can message with the, cri cri with the right messaging. If you know somebody's a homeowner before you ever talk to them, your messaging needs to be about your value that you offer homeowners, both as they're purchasing and buying and selling at the same time. So we have to watch kind of how the AI, that person may identify themselves as a homeowner, which technically then they should be added as a seller because they're a homeowner and they're purchasing a house. And most mm -hmm. homeowners will decide to purchase and look for the house they buy before they ever start thinking about selling. So if we treat them as a homeowner, like a buyer, we're not really giving them value on what we could do to help them list or get their home sold the correct way. So we have to just be careful. So to Adam's point, your landing pages and how you message them can express that out. And so that's a great point. Adam, that you're bringing up. If you are marketing the areas that have 65 and 75% homeowner ownership, then you're probably going to be getting homeowner leads when you market to them, not just quote buyers. So we have to think about the areas as well as the landing pages of who our target fish is so that we could put the right bait and the right reel in to reel them in the right way based on their identity. Can't reel in a buyer if they're a homeowner because you're treating them like a buy or not what, a seller what this reminded me of brian you're right on um and i know we're we're past a little bit on your time so brady and adam i think the next session that we do for lofty are you guys open to just coming in together and doing one on landing pages for about an hour just let la just landing pages everything you can do with landing pages what you can add processes how you set up ai that would be beautiful we're going to need more than an hour, but yes, absolutely. Yeah. 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 <laughs> you're, you're, it's, have you well, listen, go for <laughs> Great training because most systems out there that agents are using now can't customize all their outreach into a specific target audience. It's like literally yeah. unlimited ability to bait your hook with the right specific bait. And the quality of intent can come with how you bait your hook. You know what, Brian, we probably need you on this one too, just so you can talk <laughs> about call, call to action. So, yeah. so I, you give us ideas on what this would look like. So, um, you know, Adam, Brady, Brian, let's do this probably for December. I don't know what we had planned for December, but let's do it for December. So, and one of the, one of the things I would add to that, I think just to kind of take more actionable steps for the audience would be not only the lead generation concepts as far as it pertains to landing pages, but just one more step, not a, not a full on uh, follow up situation, but we generated the lead to the landing page. We got them in our system. What's the very next step that we do? How can we utilize the tools in Lofty to carry the conversation from ad copy to landing page to that initial follow-up in the system and kind of reestablishing the relationship? And again, you know, just talking like the first couple of steps, we're not doing this whole like, hey, here's how you nurture somebody for 18 months kind of a thing. Just that initial you know, you're, you're getting them in the system from a landing page. Now, what do you do? What do you need to have set up so that you don't leave them behind? Cause like leaving a lead behind and, and like they're on an Island that that's the worst thing you can do to somebody. So I think those, those kind of things would be uh, pretty beneficial. I love that. All right, guys. Uh, thank you, Adam. Can you do me a favor before you leave, yes. put in a way to contact you because I know people may want to hire you to help them build out their whole lofty system, right? Maybe they want to go into detail. I know you do that. Uh, you've got a barbecue method, which I love. I mean, I you do. might yep. make so the most amazing barbecue, but you've also got yeah. the method. 
I um so I got loftyguy.com and loftysetup.com. Loftyguy.com is my uh schedule. Um, as far as my calendar goes, you can ask me how my services can help. You can take a look at my services on loftysetup.com. Um, and I do help. It doesn't matter what bro, like I don't care where you hang your license. I, I really don't. Um, it, it's if you're a lofty user and you need some help, I will help you. That's just plain and simple. So. Thanks, buddy. Appreciate you. And Brady, thank you for being on. Is there a way to get a hold of you? Or do we just go to the section on the help on the top right and then go from there? Click in there and I'll, I'll be there in a, in a GIF. No, uh, you anybody can reach me. I'll post my email address here in the chat. Um, but I just want to thank all of the Lab Code agents folks for participation in this webinar. It, it means an awful lot. And also a massive thank you to our clients. Um, we truly appreciate you attending. Hopefully we've learned a little bit and um, looking forward to continuing to serve you. And if you're not a part of the Lofty family yet and you're curious, please go to lofty.com. There's a very easy way for you to fill out your first name, last name, email, and phone number. Someone for our, from our team will quickly reach out to you and help coordinate a demo. And, you know, knowledge is power, right? So we encourage you to come in and check us out if you haven't yet. And other than that, thank you so much for having me. It's, it's always a pleasure. I really appreciate you. Thanks, you too. Appreciate you. All right, let's do a giveaway really quick. I need the word lofty in the chat. We're going to give away a swag bag, probably a shirt, a hat, a uh, brand new Tesla. I'm joking. The kit doesn't fit in the bag. But uh, just type in the word chat. I'm sorry, the word lofty in the chat. I'm going to pick somebody right now. Uh, in five, four, three, two, one. Okay, let's see who was at the bottom of that one. Uh, O'Neill Days. O'Neill Days, if you could just put in your phone number and email address, and then we will contact you after O'Neill Days. Thank you so much. It's a swag bag. And remember, we're going to give away the watch at the end. So hang in there. That's the Apple Watch that I will not be winning. So it will be one of you. <laughs> All right, Brian, Ashley, could you please do a quick intro of yourselves, Brian? Yeah, um, I'm Brian Hoyleman. I'm the Chief Strategy Officer for Lofty. Uh, been in the space for almost now 20 years from just about every tech stack you could imagine and some in different verticals and worked in enterprise, broker sales, uh, direct sales, strategic sales, product development, everything from lead gen to marketing to advertising to IDX, you name it. So looking forward to talk about where things are going to be, what's going to be happening next year, what to look forward in the space. Ashley? Uh, yeah, take it off from your side. I'm Ashley Terrell. I'm our Chief Revenue Officer at Raise. I've been in the industry for about 15 years now. Um, in addition to being the CRO at Raise, uh, I am also an advisor for for Lofty. I love that. Thanks for being on, guys. Appreciate it. Thanks for taking the time to do that. So let's let's talk about the road ahead. What does this look like, Brian? So, you know, what, we're, what me and Ashley wanted to talk about today, more like a TED talk and go over kind of a little bit. She's really in tune with what's happening with the commission lawsuit, with Ray's and how things are going, how that's going to shape into next year. I'm looking at how technology and related to how leads are getting provisioned through the system in 17,000 ways. And how do we maintain a search to settlement value all the way through the system? Because everything that you guys talked about on the previous call, how can agents watch 5,000 leads, 10,000 leads? 50,000 leads in a database and pay attention to all of them moving forward in the next year and with how we have to create relationships and value related to, hey, I got to get a buyer agency contract. Well, how do I do that? And where do I go about doing that? How do I create value to get somebody to do that with me? And then at the same time, how do I create homeowner value all the way through the process? So when they're ready to sell, they're going to pick my number and not somebody else's number. We can't wait until the end we have to start developing relationships and how we do that with systems. That's going to be the future in the next year is making sure we're using AI and automation to create relationships from leads, as opposed to wait for a lead that's ready to buy and say, Hey, I'm ready to buy. Let me put you in my cart and take you to the to checkout stand. We're not transactional anymore. We've basically turned back the clock to go back to old school real estate relationship, people building. And how do you do that? And, and moving forward, how can technology help? That's where we're in and what next year is going to be all about. So, Ashley, um, I think three things that are going to drive that we want to talk about as a, as a high level. One is the commission lawsuit and some of the things that she's seen when it comes to statistics where agents 
are seeing how to get that buyer agency agreement, what's happening there. And then on my part, the things that's happening with lead validation, verification, and certification that's coming coming in the next year, being able to basically have yourself as the permission to contact your leads is all changing in the next year. And you how you document that within systems. So we need to make sure agents are really, really having one true source of truth for where their leads originated and giving them permission to contact those leads from the origination of that lead in your system. It's all changing in the next year. And that's going to be that driver is all of those three things are really going to change how we do lead gen and where we get leads from into next year. So Ashley, why don't you hit up and kind of give them some feedback on a little bit about the commission lawsuit, what you're doing with Ray's in relationship to kind of next year and how you see lead gen and marketing and advertising be effect, being affected by these things. Well, to your point, Brian, there's there's two big things going on. There's what you were talking about with leads, and then there's those these commissions lawsuits that I'm pretty sure all, everybody has heard about. <laughs> That's and that one's Absolutely. no secret. And it's changing the dynamic of how realtors are going to have to interact with their buyers in all of those leads. Where we're at today, especially when we look at with what happened with the lawsuits, the two things that happened, I know I'm repeating what we all know, but one, we removed cooperative compensation out of the MLS, and two, we have to get buyer rep agreements signed. And so what that is creating is a situation where agents may find themselves talking to a buyer, having to articulate their value and stand by the fee that they want to charge. The reality is consumers think that you guys spend less than 15 hours to successfully get them into a home. So there's a big disconnect between the reality. Do you, uh, and I guess we probably can't do this because everybody, unless someone wants to put it in the chat, does anybody have an idea of what an average home purchase takes for an agent as far as hours go? Let's see if any numbers. I, had, in I hadn't thought about that, Ashley. I'm, I'm going to guess too. Let's see what, yeah, let's see what well, I'm curious because I look at this as how much time in a day do you have to manage that buyer? That, yeah. that transaction, that thing, and how many hours you spend. Plus, you got to follow up. Plus, you got to nurture. Plus, you got to do all these things. And we're getting, so I'm getting 80 hours. So how much do you get paid an hour? You know, when you start breaking down what you're really paid per effort, and mm -hmm. we're not conveying that to the consumer in a dynamic way. We have to start Good doing point. that moving forward. We have we, to put that do. in a message. So so uh, let me just break down. I, I am a data person. Actually, when I started in this industry, I was actually on the data side of it. So I love this type of stuff. Consumers think you guys spend less than 15 hours on a home purchase. The average is 87 hours. You're navigating wow. through over 200 different outcomes to successfully get the buyer into a home. And the fact of the matter is, is that finding a home on Zillow is actually about 5% of the work. So I know, I mean, we all know this, right? Plenty of agents are saying, okay, yeah, fine. Find the home on Zillow. Send it to me because I have all the other stuff I have to do for you. But there's a big disconnect in the consumer visibility into the transaction of what happens outside of what they're seeing with you touring homes or perhaps sending them a safe search or anything like that. And so I also like to look at how consumers like to transact in other areas of their life. I personally um, order Instacart three times a week, maybe four. <laughs> um, I just don't have the time to go to the store. And quite frankly, I don't have the patience to go to the store anymore. Um, as working professionals, we all are. There's a level of convenience that we pay for Consumers are actually about 51% of consumers are willing to pay more for better customer service. 70% of consumers are willing to pay more for convenience. And so we keep hearing this talk about commission pressure and, you know, oh, realtors are, they don't, they don't deserve this. They don't deserve this. Well, again, you think that we spend 15 hours. We actually spend 80 to hundred hours. Let me articulate, let me explain to you why, because do, do you want to go through this on your own? You're insane. And so one of the mm. stories I analogies I always use is my mom, she was a Zillow lead. She came in, she was moving from San Francisco, moving to a Tascadero, didn't know the area, found literally found a couple properties on Zillow, filled out her little mm -hmm. lead form. Jake the realtor from Remax called her. She ended up setting up some safe searches. <laughs> I don't even know who Jake is, by the way. For all I know, he's on this call. <laughs> yeah, Hi, I told Jake. lots of stories about him. <laughs> I know, <he's laughs> I here. Um, so anyways, but um, so she, he, you know, he did a phenomenal job explaining to her the area where she might want to live. She finally made the trip down and met him in person, toured houses with him, but was definitely doing this from four hours away, right? A lot of it was virtual. A lot of it was remote. And he went above and beyond for her as a buyer. Fast forward seven years to this day, I still hear from my mom. Oh, Jake did this for us. Jake, when, when rates dropped years ago, 
Jake called her and said, hey, did you know that rates are lower? You can maybe refinance. She had a place that she could build out as an ADU. He helped come in and consult her on that and helped her appraise it. So he's done multiple things over the last seven years to help her. And I asked my mom, mom, do you know how much Jake got paid when you bought that house? And she said, no. And I said, you don't? She's like, well, no, because uh, at the time the seller paid it. So then I asked her, I said, mom, do you know that Jake got paid about $5,000 for everything that you just listed off for me that he's done over the last seven years? Because I did the math and I know what the sale price was and I can make assumptions off of this, the referral fee to Zillow and the broker split. I can make an assumption. It was probably about $5,000. She's like, that's it. And I said, mom, if you knew that he was going to do this and 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 going to do this for the last seven years, and then you had to potentially pay that fee or pay a portion of it because the seller wasn't going to cover all of it, would you have done it? She said, yes. I said, would you have paid 7,500? She said, yes. So del delving into next year, I've just, oh. she told me this story as we were prepping for this. And what I would tell everybody on this call is we have to stop thinking we're pay less and let people shop on Zillow to do business there. They don't do business there. Only about four and a half percent of people transact through th Zillow realtors on average, even on the appointments, by the way, Tristan, only four and a half percent of Zillow flex people on appointments actually get a deal on average. So the reality of it is, is what we have to start thinking is we've got to be a concierge. We have to be an advisor for people that are all lead. So I hate the word lead. I like people. We, we have to stop treating a person that registers on Google and saying, oh, I don't want to deal with them because they're not ready to go in my car and show a home. Well, now you have to, now moving forward, you have to show that value. You have to make them think that you're putting them on listing alerts, that you're paying attention. It's not just here's your alerts and forget about it. Like on the last call, it's about make sure that you craft options and obligation and things that you need to talk about where you're landing and provide value of what you're doing for them as opposed to them thinking they're self-shopping. And what we've done is self create a, a, a whole world of self shoppers. And when the music stops, who they happen to be in front of them gets a deal. Now we, everything moving forward for, you know, having to get a written agreement, everything needs to be treated differently in a lead database. Now moving forward, you have to be ready and prepared where you get leads, hyper localism, creating local farms, farming your leads, creating databases with people that you can take out to breakfast or dinner or, or do a wine tasting with and invite your database. You have to create relationships and value outside of here, look at a home and call me when you're ready to do a transaction, I'll show it. We're moved away from transactional business and we're moving to actually deliver what your profession. And I'm gonna say this because I'm very, 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 very adamant. Our profession is to turn people that are renting into potential first time home buyers and elevate their experience through the entire life cycle of their journey post pre and future sales. They do. They are my asset. They buy a house. I want to help them. So we have to start treating all leads as people and assets to grow our business and not treating them like a waste of time because they're not ready to buy. Now we're not going to deserve a commission. It. They yeah, deserve your it. Cl your clients deserve it. And quite frankly, you guys all deserve it too, to, to be able to provide that level of customer service, get those referrals and even get your work recognized. So shifting into what's next, next year is to be more cognizant of having an end-to-end -end experience solution. We can't store our leads into a CRM that doesn't send listing alerts. I can't have my leads in an MLS feed because now they're disconnected from the experience that I'm trying to deliver. And, and how, do I, how do I check what, what those listing alerts are going, all those marker reports, who's getting them, how are they engaged? You have to start thinking about that permission to call that lead that's happening in January. So as you guys do lead gen in January, you're going to have to have written permission to actually physically dial a lead. You're going to have to have written permission to text the lead moving forward in a certificate. And that has to be one-to-one. -one. That means that when your lead comes in, they're going to register that you're giving me by name permission to contact me. So then as you leave your systems, that you want to take that with you. You just don't mm -hmm. want to abandon your databases. You want to have ownership of your leads because that owns that certificate to put them in a contract. This is all in the next year. This is all good news for everybody listening because it puts you at the center of the transaction now. It puts you at the center by contract. But that means your 10,000 leads in your database, you have to treat them like an actual person and not a lead anymore. 
question for you, uh, either of you. Uh, Linda says, this lead permission to contact is for the United States or is it specific to Lofty? No, it's all over. It's every every lead TCPA rule that's moving forward is, has a certification. It's in the 2025 TCPA um, uh, compliance issues that are coming up. Yeah, and that's why, by it? the way, that's why you're having Zilla with Premier Agent and Realtor.com with connections. That's why they're they're, they're locking trying to, everything down. Like, yeah, they're trying to figure out what to do because the lead can only go to one specific team agent and on top of that it's only for a period of time that you can reach out that you have permission so uh when you have a chance google that that that's going to change the way we we do business for sure you, you massive movie news. massive news and so yeah it's not including canada great great question i don't know what canada is doing along these lines this u.s base it does affect the lending industry lenders can't you know, if you have a lead lead form that has like you want to sell that lead three to seven times, they won't be able to sell it to 37 different people. It's you're controlling your own database and written permission. So you have to have an end-to-end -end solution, search to settlement solution to man your leads and also re-engage the leads that you already have in your database. So we're really getting into making you the center of that relationship more than ever. So my message to everybody is value landing pages with value content with value, providing PDFs of buyer representations of what you're going to do. Put yourself in a situation as, as an agent. What is your value that you're going to deliver? We do that on the listing side of things, but now we have to do it in the buyer presentation of value type of things. So uh, here at Lofty, we have a, what we call Lofty present, but that also extends to Lofty present for buyers. So you can actually customize a buyer presentation right within Lofty. A lot of people don't know that. They can customize it, have a buyer presentation, put all the content they need, send it in a PDF, tell them what you're going to do for them. There's nothing better than anybody here driving into their database today, opening it up, pull up the most active leads and say, I'm going to do this this week. Would you like to have it done by Friday? You don't well, have to do it unless they respond. Sorry, Ashley. Oh, no, no, no. It's fine. I was going to say too, it's a great thing that with what we're doing here with Ray's which ties 100% into your buyer presentations is we're actually giving the consumer that transparent experience through that journey. But more importantly, we're helping the agent understand how they're spending time in different areas. So when they do sit down in that buyer presentation, we have real-time data where we can actually say that, hey, on average, we're probably gonna go on this many showings and hey, I'm probably gonna have to write this many offers. And this is how much work I have ahead of me, but, I also get an average of $22,000 in closing credits. And I also am able to negotiate properties up to this much over or under ask, or I win this many offers. There's a lot of really cool data points that I think you guys all know you have, but sometimes it's hard to pull it all together in one. And that's what we're doing at Raise is helping that, that like agents articulate that value in those buyer presentations with real life data. And we're providing the ins and everybody should be looking at their tech stacks. How do I provide the end-to-end -end consumer experience mm -hmm. through one communication flow? And most, you know, as we go out there, our, our whole goal in the next year is to provide the most dynamic way for agents to generate people into the database, whether it's through a Facebook social post, content, blogging, SEO. We just launched one of the best SEO creators and all of the agents that have our full platform have the ability to have their own SEO engine. And a lot of people don't know that. So we're trying to create the most dynamic way to generate traffic for agents into people, into their ecosystem. And then that traffic all the way through, give permission to contact both homeowners and renters in a dynamic way so that they can now be the agent of choice on buyer presentations. All of this needs to be built as a, as a, as this. And I'm, I'm not saying Lofty is the only solution to look at, but you have to ask those hard questions. What's going to give me the best chance to create an end-to-end -end, end -end experience, not a fractional experience moving forward? And that's what we need to be looking at next year. Your landing page for the wine accessory or charity event you're sponsoring is a great way to do a, a people creating proposition that gives you now written permission to contact people that came to your charity event because they're just people. So, Tyna, what questions does um, 
you know, there's costs on, I know this question, Terrence asked, what does it cost? Foo solution is going to be typical of any end-to-end -end solution, unless you're with a broker, the affiliate of ours, like other people on this call that are brokers that have Lofty that provide to their agent. So it just depends on whether you're with a broker affiliate that uses Lofty for their agents or whether you want to buy a standalone independent instance. Uh, you can go to our website, find out. The cost can range depending on where the, the access is for uh, Lofty, I know you could speak to that, Tristan, a little bit about how that works in the space as well. If, they, if they're asking their broker tough questions is, what are you providing me to make sure that I have an end-to-end -end process? And asking yeah, those hard I think, questions. I think combining Lofty and Raise together, <laughs> that solves <laughs> a massive problem for, for our agents. It's, it really it's is. A great thing. Just yeah. a new way of having to understand how you're working with these buyers. I mean, going back to the original points, there's two thing, big things that are happening. And it, honestly, I don't think it's that big of a deal on having to figure out how to navigate through it. We just need a, like everyone needs a little support, you know, where it's a change of process and we're used to working one way and now we got to do it another, but overall I, it's going to provide a more elevated customer experience. Absolutely. And remember, whichever way that you have Lofty, whether it's through a broker affiliate, or if you're a broker and you just want to provide Lofty to your agents in an option, or if you want to be an agent that wants to learn how to get an individual instance, or you are a Lofty instance, the product is the same end-to-end -end type of solution, whether it's provided by the broker or it's a direct instance, and it's a private relationship instance. And Tristan, you know as much as I know, agents don't want to use a database from a broker unless they have privacy and portability. So no matter which way you get lofty, you have privacy and portability. So that means that your database is now should be with written permission owned by you. So the reality is everything to do with your database is changing in the next year. Everything. Everything about commissions is changing. So life cycle, lifelong leads, person leads, communicating leads, how you generate leads. Leads have more value to your business than ever before. They have to be treated with like a baby bird. I could say like a little baby that hatches out of an egg. They don't know whether they're going to be a big chicken someday. But you got to raise that chicken to want to do business with you. It's an old analogy. You want to feed them, cuddle them, snuggle them, keep them warm. Well, very true. And look, if you have questions about what Raise does, Ashley just put up the link. Please do yourself a favor. Take a look at Raise. There's the link. And obviously, we've been putting in the link for Lofty. Uh, but Raise is is an absolutely amazing company that just allows the transparency to happen to allow us to then do more transactions in the future and lock in the ones we want to do right now with those buyers we want to work with. So, uh, hey James, what's up, James? What's going on, my friend? How are you? I'm good. good. Thanks. Thanks for jumping in, man. We were just wrapping up with Brian and Ashley. Oh. Ashley, anything you want to leave us with, or Brian? I just wanted to thank uh, Ashley for joining me with Raise on this topic. Um, it's really kind of how we're going to live with this new, the new rules moving forward, both in those permission to contact your leads and generating leads in relationship building. And then with James and what um, these guys are doing at raise and some of their knowledge based on how to maintain the, the scalability of your business at all levels through your buyer agency agreements, through your content, through your, how you relationship build with both homeowners and renters to make you their choice. It's really important that, we can do that moving forward. And um, I think both uh, Ray's and James and Ashley are on the, on the, on the front end lines. Um, Lofty's on the front end lines of those changes moving forward. And I'm glad that we have James. He's going to be up next to talk a little bit about that transition, the way the industry is and how to build those longer lasting relationships and count um, and transparency and what you do as you transact with buyers and sellers. Yep. And I'll add this to you guys. A couple of you keep putting in the, um, in the comments, I put the raise link in there. It's also, that's how you spell it right there, .com. Um, if you guys do fill out a form, we do have an automated email that will come out and actually give you more information, including product videos and stuff like that. And Trish, I know some people are asking for my personal contact information. You can add my email too. Yeah, uh, I just added that your social security it. number in the chat too. So. <laughs> <laughs> and the, there's a cell phone in the in the chat bot um back there that i gave to one of my longtime uh friends in the space for a long time that i said call me on uh, agent attraction by the way you, agent attraction is providing this type of tech stack and then i know james if you're trying to attra attract people to your business james is a lot of experience in attracting uh high level agents as well you have to present them with a way to do business more effectively moving forward as an owner as well and as a mm -hmm. as a mentor so either way thanks guys I don't want to take any more James's time. 
Thank you guys. Thanks, Have guys. a good day. Thanks, Ashley. Appreciate you guys. Mm -hmm. All right, right after James, we're gonna be giving away the Apple Watch. So stay tuned for that. And we've got James is gonna be talking about the buyer agency, best practices and the NAR ruling. James, can you do a quick intro? So those that don't know you, know you. Yeah, so uh, first off, if I can get screen sharing just to find out who can give me that ability, I'll go through a PowerPoint deck. Tristan, I don't know if that's you or somebody else, but for those of you that don't know me, I'm the tallest person in residential real estate. Uh, I run a franchise called Next Home. I'm also third generation. So my grandfather started his company in 1967. Uh, both my grandparents were brokers. Both my parents were real estate brokers, had their own company. I worked for them in the early part of my career. I've also started and sold several prop tech companies and now I've uh, run several real estate franchise brands. So I have been in this business from the day I was born. Um, I consider myself an OG now at this point. So um and if you haven't seen me, I do a lot of speaking around the country on uh, certainly around the litigation that has occurred over the past uh, year. Um, I unfortunately was one of the people saying that the lawsuits were not going to go in our way um, and have been talking about how to mitigate some of that uh, legal risk. Candidly, we're in the first inning of lawsuits and legal risk. Our industry is not moving uh, in the right direction in many ways. And I'm going to cover that in some of my presentation today, as soon as you can get me screen sharing. So yeah, let me know when you get it, man, because I'm not host. So I, I already put out saying the host isn't presentation. allowing multiple presenters sharing for this webinar. So yeah, very interesting. Well, look, in the meantime, as I get it for you, uh, where do you see us going now with the NAR settlement uh, about to be signed off November 26th? Anything, any changes, the DOJ stepping in or not? No. Um, I do think they'll file potentially an amicus brief uh, on it, but the time period for them to object to the settlement was in October. Um, Judge, and I should give context for those of you who are uh, here. I also was a named defendant um, and have settled. So I have more insight than 99.9% .9 of the people in this industry because I had to go through the litigation and settle out um, and have had direct, obviously, contact with the plaintiff's lawyers. These settlements will all be approved. Judge Boo, who has been handling this case out of Missouri in federal court there, has basically signed off on all of these things, rubber stamped it, doesn't really care what any of the objectors have to say. Um, he's been sort of, I would say, in uh, getting this thing moving the direction it has been as quickly as possible. So I don't see any reason why the NER settlement won't be finalized, as well as all of the other defendants, myself included, uh, will be signed off on those cases. There is one lawyer named Tanya who has an objection that she might take to the Eighth Circuit um, that basically that these settlements don't go far enough. Um, again, that would be through an appeal, and I'm not convinced that that's going to go anywhere. Uh, but as far as I'm concerned, and most of the lawyers that are involved in this, these cases will all settle out. What you see is what you get. So. And wow. just to make a point, the uh, plaintiff's lawyers will have made uh, one third of the but will end up being close to $1.5 billion out of the uh, the case. So plaintiffs themselves might get 50 bucks, maybe 60. Damn, like that. that's nuts. Only? Well, if you take uh, the entire class, so you got a four-year class of every home seller that bought or sold a house during that time frame, and you divide that out over the course of what might end up being $1.5 billion and take one third of that out of the mix, which you got left divided out, you're not going to get much money because it's all just a scheme. So. And how much are the attorneys getting? One third. Damn. Yeah. Um, I don't know if we're going to get screen sharing. So maybe I'll just talk through a few things. Does that, does that work yeah. for you, Tristan? That, so that works for me. You know what? Let me, um, I'm going to see if I can get in right now through the other angle, give me 20 seconds. Well, let me just jump on a few things and then if you can yeah, get screen sharing, I'll please. come back to a few slides here. So um, I should have access now, it says, let me see here. Nope, still not allowing me access. So mm. um, let me just go through a couple of things while we're while we're tap dancing here. Number one is I wanna make sure everybody understands some, some things about where we are as an industry. Um, and as soon as I can get screen sharing, I'll show you some examples of this. I wanna go through a little bit of scripting as well that you need to be aware of. Yeah. So number one is Michael Ketchmark, who you all are acutely aware of, um, you know, came out with an interview about two months ago 
Uh, this is a quote directly from him. We've been monitoring what's been happening in the industry with a lot of these webinars and training programs, just seeing how people are interpreting uh, this settlement and what their intention is. If anyone thinks they're going to be able to avoid the application of this settlement, Looks like we lost him. Okay. Interesting. Well, he should be coming back. In the meantime, you could look at my hat and my background, which is pretty cool. And for those of you that were wondering, it, last name is James Dwiggins. He runs Next Home, and he was involved in, in that case directly because they sued him, and he did settle. So we will be talking. Thanks, Alex. Appreciate it. Right, Captain America? Superman, Spider-Man, we've got a lot here. Uh, so as soon as we can get him back in here, we'll be talking about that. In the meantime, uh, I do want to let you know one of the things that we're doing over this process to be able to connect better with those people that we meet and talk to is we, we created this one-sheeter. And if you were on earlier, you remember that I showed Gamma, Gamma.app. We, we created this one sheeter. So at open houses or people that we're talking to online or over the phone, we're talking to them and saying, Hey, you know, have you heard about this whole new process, the way that real estate agents are working? And we created this one sheeter to give out to people so that they're able to, to understand what this whole new world looks like. And I'm going to share it with you right now. So you can see how easy it was to create. We just put in the right things. So on gamma, we have this new landscape for real estate. And the new landscape for real estate, you can see here, the new landscape of real estate transactions. We made it into one simple sheet. And we tell them what it is, transparency, negotiation, responsibility, decoupling. And we simply hand this out. We hand this out and it's, let me stop sharing really quick. Um, we hand this out to everyone that comes through our open houses. We hand this out to everybody that comes through for our online leads that have questions like, hey, wh what is that? And I'm going to share that with you guys. So you have that. Give me a second. Uh, and then I'm going to see what happened with um, grab that link. Let me know. Once I put in the link, I'm going to need some yeses. Okay. There we go. Uh so interesting. James says he got booted. Sorry. Let me see what's up. Let me see what's up. Hmm. All right. You guys can all open this. Perfect. And let me see how James got booted because I was the only one on here having them. Excellent. So what you want to do is recopy that, print it out if you want, create your own, uh, but gives you an idea of of what you could give out because people are trying to understand what's happening. What's the big deal with, with everybody. So let me see a host panelist. Um, James, I'm going to see if James is in the, yeah, it's not letting me in. Hmm, interesting. Okay. Jump in the registration and I'll get you in. Okay. In the meantime, uh, just remember the value that you're giving people is more of an understanding of what's happening and how you're interpreting it for them. This is why I wanted James on here. And James, see if you can raise your hand if you're on here, because I said you said you wanted to register in and jump in. Keep an eye out for James, everybody, as he's in here or as he's in the group. There you go. All right. Part two, my friend. Part two. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, in the meantime, I'll tell you what I did, James, just so you know. I I had this sheet that I created just really quick, the new landscape of real estate transactions that we've been yeah. handing out during open houses. And I was like, you know, we, we all need to give this type of value to people. Like, how are we communicating with them, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, gotta love technology when it doesn't work right. I think I was mid-sentence talking about Catchmark, and then I ended up in a black screen. So... Yeah. Um, whatever. Uh, so look, here's, here's the deal. I wanted to share just a few things so that people know this. And I know we only have like 20 minutes left, so I'll go through this somewhat fast. Um, number one is Catchmark 
and Douglas Miller, who are two of the lead lawyers that are involved in this. I can actually share. So I'm going to do this now. Can everybody see this? Are we up? We got a thumbs up. We got you, man. We got you. Yay. Okay. So here's the quote from Michael Ketchmark. So everybody knows what I want to make the first comment on is everybody that is on this phone call needs to stop doing workarounds and be paying very close attention to understanding what it is that the plaintiff's lawyers are looking at. So for example, they do not want to see you using commission sharing websites is absolutely something to stay away from. You can share compensation on your personal website, your brokerage website, your individual advertising. But if you are doing anything that is similar to what got us in these lawsuits to begin with, why, for instance, you cannot share on the MLS, if you go to a website where you have competitors sharing compensation on a website that is similar to an MLS, they're going to sue you. I want to add context. My legal bills were $100,000 a month during the litigation. So 99.9% wow. of you on this call can't afford that. Stop doing workarounds. Really important what you're hearing here. Okay. Number two, Douglas Miller. This is the lead lawyer that set things up with the Morrell case out of Illinois. Why you've seen so many companies move away from using forms that are created by a group of competitors, i.e. a committee of competitors creating a form that has cooperative compensation on it. If you read the quote, he's being very clear about the fact if using forms created by competitors props up compensation, you're going to see litigation similar to what you saw in the Morrell and Sitzer cases. I want to just make sure everybody understands this as somebody who's been through this litigation. If you are trying to work around the terms of the settlement or you're not following it, you're going to get sued and it will either bankrupt your business or you'll spend a fortune trying to defend yourself in the cases. These quotes nobody saw in these interviews. And so I want to make them very front and center as I go through a few of these topics. This is really important to understand where the industry is going to move. And we're having this big debate as an industry and it just doesn't make any sense to me. Where we're going to end up long term is the buyer rep agreement sets the fee that you as a buyer's agent are going to charge the buyer. How that fee is paid can be part of the contract, can be paid by the buyer, et cetera. The listing agent is going to charge their fee in the listing agreement, and you're not going to see cooperative compensation at all in the future. It is going away because it is actually harming sellers based upon the way that we are doing business today. I know people are going to get really irritated with what I'm about to say, but Tristan, it'll make sense. If you're doing cooperative compensation today where you are collecting your fee and a fee to share with the buyer brokerage, mm -hmm. you are potentially harming your seller because you have no idea as a listing agent what the fee was that the buyer and the buyer agent agreed to in that buyer rep agreement. So let me give you an example. Let's pretend the fee that you collected as a listing agent is more than the fee that the buyer and the buyer agent agreed to in that buyer rep agreement. And you're advertising that amount publicly. You're telling the buyer agent what your seller is willing to do, and they're going to ask for the difference as a concession. One of the next class action cases that you will see is going to be these plaintiff's lawyers suing everybody who's doing cooperative compensation. They're going to get a copy of the listing agreement. They're going to get a copy of the buyer rep agreement. They're going to look at what the buyer agent needed to be paid. They're going to look at the fee that you advertised in advance of an offer. The difference becomes damages. You have an entirely new class. The proper process needs to be that the purchase agreement distributes everything, meaning put what you need in the offer, make it part of that process. Christian, you have any questions on that before I go a little further here? No, man, I'm, I'm good. I like Put this. it in the offer. Everything needs to be about putting in the offer. In fact, in my company, we don't even have the buyer agent call the listing agent and ask what's being offered because we don't care. Whatever the fee is that the agents on the buy side negotiated with the buyer is the fee that they're paid and the buyer and the buyer agent will work out how that needs to be done. If the buyer can't afford to pay it, what does it do? We put it in the offer and make it part of the deal terms. This whole thing here about steering and legal liability, I cannot emphasize enough how big of a problem this has become. And if you are sh not showing properties because a seller's not offering compensation in advance of an offer and you move somebody somewhere else, you are steering. This process is so simple. It's just put whatever the buyer needs to make a deal close. 
put it in the offer unless you're in North Carolina. <laughs> it's a different process there. But for everybody else, put it in the offer and make it part of the deal terms. And I, I want to emphasize this, this really hard and heavy. This is what the DOJ classifies as steering. I understand that fair housing issues are different, but the DOJ, this is their quote, so everybody understands this, as long as sellers can make buyer broker commission offers, they will continue to offer customary commission out of the fear that buyer brokers will direct buyers away from listings with lower commissions, a well-documented documented phenomenon known as steering. Also, if you don't show a property because the seller isn't offering something in advance, that's steering. If your buyer says, I don't want to see houses that aren't offering compensation. It is your responsibility to explain to them that that's not what they should be doing. They should be looking at all properties for sale and will simply make it part of the deal terms. Why I'm emphasizing that is this, the world is going to end up where there is no cooperative compensation. That's why EXP, Real, my company, well, tons of others have moved away from it because of liability and because it harms the seller. So I want to make sure that's very clear. Number two, this right here, this is extremely important what you're looking to the right. And this has now been clarified by the National Association of Realtors so that everybody sees this. You cannot be paid more than what you put and agree to in your buyer rep agreement. Period. The end. The reason for that is to avoid steering. If you can modify your buyer rep agreement up because the seller is offering more money than what you agreed to in your buyer rep agreement, then you are incented to show them houses that are offering more, which creates steering. So you can't offer incentives to the buyer's agent like this or builders doing this. None of that is allowed anymore. In fact, if you're doing this, stop because you're actually giving the plaintiff's information to show that you're trying to steer or influence somebody to show a property. You can do this to the buyer. You can offer an incentive to the buyer to buy the home directly from the seller. That is perfectly legal, but you don't want the intermediary to be doing this. So that's an extremely important part I wanted to share with here about some of the legal risks that are happening that I'm seeing all over the country. And you have got to make sure that you're paying close attention to what it is that you're doing. Now, Let's go through a few objection handlings, Tristan, while I got everybody, and then I'll talk about value proposition to give them something to walk away with. So first of all, I'm going to give you four scripts that are being taught around the country. These are almost identical between, not identical, but they're similar in the way that the companies that are not doing uh, commission sharing are operating. Why do I have to sign an agreement with you to see a home for sale? All realtors now required to have buyers sign a buyer representation agreement before showing any home in the MLS. The agreement outlines our working relationship, your expectations, and the services I'll provide, as well as the fee that I charge. We can adjust. This is super important. We can adjust the term of the agreement to a shorter time frame or a limited number of homes if you'd like. We can then choose to extend the agreement. Remember, the buyer rep agreement is a choice for both of you. If you just met this person off, you know, lofty, they were a lead that came in, and you're going to meet them at the doorstep, learn to use your buyer rep agreement, but make it so it's just that house. It's just this specific property that I'm showing you today. Work on the relationship so that you can figure out whether you want to do something exclusive, whether you want to do it a shorter term. I don't believe in touring agreements personally. Get really comfortable with your buyer rep agreement because you can modify the terms, make it something that's standard in your business practice. I can't afford to pay your fee outlined in the agreement. We can request the seller pay my fee through the purchase agreement or include seller concessions that allow seller funds to be used towards closing costs. We'll make it part of the deal and I'll make it clear to the listing agent this is required to be done. Again, you're representing the buyer. Be very clear with them and set this up front. Can you afford to pay my fee? No. Then we're going to make it part of the deal terms. Understand that's part of the process. And we're going to have to work through this as we negotiate on the terms of the contract. So you need to be very clear and, and concise with the buyer and explain to them. Again, we're going to show you. I'm going to do this example here. We're going to show you all the homes for sale. What if I just go direct listening to represent me? Uh, listening represents the seller and their fiduciary is to the seller. There's no guarantee that approach will save you money and it may end up costing you more as dual agency. This is extremely important, by the way. And unrepresented buyer transactions have a much higher risk of ending up in litigation. 17 and 22% respectively higher chance of ending up in litigation because someone felt they were harmed by not having individual representation in this process. They got that from two of the largest insurance companies. So you want somebody in your oh. corner, make sure 
that you're explaining to them how you're representing their interests only in that process. This final comment, which I think is an industry we are horrible at explaining. I'm only paid a contingency fee if we find you the home that you love and purchase. We got to get really good at explaining to them that you're doing all of this work. And if they don't buy something, you don't get paid. They forget that as you're working with them over time. Last thing here, should we just avoid homes that are not offering to pay your fee? No, that's steering. Do ne never have a buyer sign anything or agree to that at all. Your job is to show them every single property. Remember, an attorney would look at that and go, oh, you're selectively steering them to properties that are offering compensation. I've seen agents do this where they haven't signed something. Horrible idea. Every property for sale, whether it's a builder, resale, doesn't matter. Show them the property, make it part of the deal terms, explain that to them in this process. This is a very simplistic way to avoid liability. Make sure you're representing the buyer correctly. Show your value, go through it. By the way, I'll give you guys a copy of this deck if you want these scripts. All right, let's go really deep here because I want to give you guys, as the whole point of this was to help you rethink your value proposition for buyers. So this is my fundamental theme and I'm gonna give you the playbook that we did for our 6,000 people. And you can take it because all the stuff I'm gonna show you is literally stuff you can go get today, all right? Number one, your, your process needs to be start learning to sit down and do a consult. We need to get back to doing this. You never meet with a seller and just hand them the, per the listing agreement, say sign here. You do a consult with them, find out what they want, where are they going, what's important to them. Get used to doing that. Obviously, learn to articulate your value. I'm going to show you how to do this in just a minute. There's obviously Lofty has a buyer presentation. I didn't realize they did, so learn something new. I put down some others that I'm aware of in the industry. Get a really good buyer presentation that you're comfortable with. And then obviously, explain your buyer rep agreement. Get very, very good at that. Now, here's the difference. So, Tristan, I think you'll love this. This is an example of how you should be approaching a buyer presentation the same you would as a listing presentation. So when you go to a listing presentation, you don't ask for comp and then just say it's my Rolodex. You've got professional photos and we're going to do touring and we're going to virtually stage it and we're going to do all this stuff to show value. We've got to get really damn good at this on the buy side. And it's pathetic as an industry. We haven't done this, in my opinion, for the past 20 years anyway. This is an example of my buyer presentation if I was out representing buyers today. So Mr. and Mrs. Buyer, not only have been in the industry my entire life, I've sold, helped people buy X number of houses, all the good fun stuff, here's all my testimonials, but here's what separates me than every other buyer's agent in my market. Number one, the second most requested thing you're gonna have as a buyer is floor plans. Unfortunately, our industry does a horrible job at putting floor plans on listings, so I have a service I offer. If you find a house you like, let me know. If it doesn't have a floor plan, I will go out. I use a product called Cuba Casa, and I will create a floor plan on that property so that you can see how the property looks, how your furniture will fit into the home, et cetera. What am I doing, Tristan? I'm increasing my value very quickly here. Number two, the seller is going to love their shag rug from the 70s. You and I both know it looks like crap. It's hard to see what the home will look like, so I have a virtual staging service that I use. By the way, there are tens and thousands of them out there to find. You can find several of them in real estate, but we can go look at the property. We can upload the photos and I'll show you what the home could look like so you can visualize what this property might be after you know you move in. There's also services like Revive. The house is currently in this condition. Uh, mm -hmm. I have this great service called Revive where we can look at it. It'll estimate for you how much money you need to put into the property and then what the up leg value of the property might be after is considering this is will be one of the biggest assets that you own. Again, another service that I do. Part of the other things I do is I, I transfer all utilities. I help you move. I get the postal service changed. I provide a home warranty. You've got to get good at doing this again for the first year on the property. Uh, I might have a moving service or moving truck. And then two of my favorites that are involved in this, again, just companies that I'm familiar with. Front door is an app I provide you when you move in. I'm going to buy this for you for the first year, but you're going to have basically a handyman in your pocket. Pull up the front door app. Uh, they'll video chat with you. If you want to learn how to use the thermostats or understand what the equipment requirements are, the maintenance needs on the property, we'll walk you through that individually. It's a service I provide to make sure you're maintaining the property. And then this is, again, a company that I've recommended. There's tons of them out there. It sounds like Lofty's doing something similar. But let's. how do you maintain that asset over the 8 to 13 years you own the home? 
This is a service that I provide where we're going to tell you when the maintenance needs to be done on this home, when you need to get things done, when things need to be inspected so that you're maintaining the biggest investment of your life. Tristan, what have I done here? My buyer console is not just showing you property, which is what they think we do. It's all about value. I'm increasing my value, which will allow you to charge a premium. So this is the final thing I'll throw out. I cannot emphasize enough that you need to think differently about the way you operate your business. I believe strongly that you could charge a premium by elevating your experience. Think about when you go to the Ritz Carlton of the Four Seasons, like you walk in and it's just like heaven, right? Everything you think of, they're already planned it. They're thinking about it ahead of you. There are tons and tons of people who would be willing to pay a premium for a higher level of service, packing the house for them, unpacking the house, like all of these things that you can do to elevate your experience further. So I like the idea of a premium and then maybe a platinum. In fact, you could even do one that's a low to lower level. Like if you're working with investors, we all know they don't need to be told how to buy a house. Like maybe it's a little bit of a less fee that you charge, but I do think you need to think about this as we move towards this new model and this new future and articulating yeah. value is not just explaining what you do. It has to do what you provide that buyer because tangible things also show monetary spend, which helps justify the fee that you're charging. All right. I'm going to end on these two slides. And then I think we've got time for a few questions. You guys saw this yeah. earlier. I believe Ashley showed this to you, this okay. stat of what buyers actually think you guys spend time wise. Maybe she didn't, I don't know, but 46% of buyers, half of them did you spend less than 15 hours helping them buy a house. The actual number is 87 hours. You'll spend around 87 hours helping them buy a house. This is a huge problem here. This is a huge problem backed up by, I just got this from Brian Boero, a thousand watt. Uh, if you guys don't follow them, check them out. This is a really bad stat. Just came out yesterday. Generally speaking, do you think real estate agents are paid too much? 57% of them now do. And those who know about the settlement, 63% of them think you all are paid too much. That number was between 40 to 45% prior to the settlement. I want to make sure everybody's like, let's this sit and marinate for a minute. If you think you're going to do business the same way you've always done it, you're wrong. You've got to be rethinking everything about your business because the consumer studies are starting to show they're questioning what we do and we've got to get better at it. The last thing is, if you have not seen this one from Rise Media, I want to make sure you look at this too. So this is the post-settlement numbers of average compensation around the country. And I think this is what you want to pay attention to. Buyer agent compensation prior to the settlement averaged 2.65 since August 17th. 2.28, and I think we have more to go because we've got to get really good at articulating value and explaining what we do. And we have to think about how we're readjusting our business so that we're not just, this is what I do, here's the 150 things. You got to add products in there. You got to really think about what a buyer wants. I mean, I had this conversation yesterday where it drives me nuts that our industry is so lazy that we can't create a freaking floor plan on a listing. It's the second most requested thing by buyers, second most requested behind professional photography. And so to me, thinking about what buyers want, which you can get in the home buyer profile study from NAR, just start checking those things off. Everything mm -hmm. they want and experience, be the person that solves all of that, and they're going to find tremendous value in what you do. So one of the last things I'll leave you with is you should download that study. They just came out with a new one. And I would read through it like, a business analysis of where, what it is that buyers and sellers want today. How am I solving those issues? They're asking for floor plans to de deliver it to them. So, all right, buddy, there you go. I'll add one thing to that, uh, James. I, I love that idea. In fact, that report, I would challenge everyone to, to upload it to, to Claude or your Anthropic and, and just go back and forth with Claude and see how you can solve this for, for either the sellers or the buyers. And so you go further. You can also use ChatGPT, but Claude does it a, a lot better for research. And then have a mastermind session through there. That That's amazing. James. I'm shocked at the number, dude. 87 hours? That is like... So 
I actually kind of talked about this, and this is literally what Raze is doing, is we track what the agent does and we surface it in this beautiful collaborative experience for the buyer to see everything the agent is going to do. And as they're doing it, it helps them understand the value. We know mm -hmm. that because we've been tracking realtors all over the country with the product since we rolled it out. 87 hours versus 15. Perception versus reality. They think you spend 15, oh. but you show 87. You don't figure out how to solve that gap, then what do they do? They're going to go, well, you're not worth the money because you don't do anything. And so that's literally what Raise is solving right now with agents all over the US. And it's doing exactly what it's intended to do. Push back on that conversation about, I, you know, I want you to do it for less, gives you confidence to have it. But more than anything, I wanted you guys to see this. I had to truncate that real fast. But I wanted you to go through like just the mindset of if you've been doing things the way you always have, stop, like rethink it. If you're looking at things from the, from the lens of where you need to be, I, there was a section of my PowerPoint, which I didn't get to go through. The mindset of consumers is they actually want to use you. And some of the studies I was going to reference was, you know, right now, dual income households, Tristan, in the United States is 60% in 1960 was 30%. Why I share that number with you? People don't wake up and go, oh, I want to buy a house and do it on my own. Nobody has the time for that shit. So like, it's all about, they want to work with somebody. They need help in this process. We just got to get really good at being the person they go to and explain why they need to pay those fees. And by the way, they'll pay it. They just are going to question it because we have, in my opinion, I can say this, I've been in the industry my whole life. We have done a really good job on the list side of explaining what we do. And we have sucked on the buy side because of the way the system was structured before. Now, I love this. I'm optimistic about this because I'm not, I get to curate my experience for my buyers the way I want to do it. And here's my last comment. Good agents are going to charge more and bad agents will charge less. Fine. Fine. Great. It gets rid of the riffraff. It makes good agents better. They're used more. But this is the best opportunity we've ever had and been forced into leveling up our game. And I promise you, we're going to be right at the center of this whole thing. But the people that do this exceptionally well, like you said, kind of make that your business plan and go through that buyer profile and just add these services. They'll pay you all day. And then that you've got a section of the market, top 10%, that will pay a premium to have you just handle everything for them. And we're missing that. No one's doing that right now. And you gotta be thinking about that Ritz Carlton customer who wants you to, they'll pay you more just to take care of all the shit. So. And James, who at least, who does it a little better normally, at least where you can find them, are those agents in luxury markets that have been doing for sure. it for a while. I think those are the ones you need to look at as agents. And say, what are they doing that they impress these these higher level individuals as far as fin financially? Uh, what are they doing that we can emulate? Which I love. And James, everyone loved your slides. How the hell did we get them? Yeah, I'll just send them to you and then you guys can distribute them out. There's a whole section in the front I didn't get to, unfortunately, but um, this is a truncated version of an hour keynote I've been doing all over the country. Um, please check it out. Um, and then, you know, if you have any questions, you're more than welcome to reach out to me too. So how do people reach out to you by emails? Uh, just or? shoot me an email. You can shoot James at next home, James at raise either one works. Um, and then just be patient because I fly a lot. So it takes me a bit to get back to everybody. So no problem, man. Well, thanks for being okay. on. I appreciate it. You got thanks it. For... Hope everybody's enjoying everything. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks, James. Thanks for you being got it. on. Yep. Yeah. All right. So let's give away the Apple watch. Here we go. Let's, uh, Let's pick a winner. But first, I need to, I need lofty. People are already starting. Hold on. Hold on. It might be something different at the end. It's not the lofty word. Relax. But plus, I love you guys. Thank you for that. I need you to first tell me what was the one nugget that you're like, man, I, I really like this. And I'm going to implement this into my business. Or it got you thinking differently. What was that? I want to. I want to just read to see what that one was for you. Uh, give me, give me Apple Watch. <laughs> That's funny. I uh, love this info, Sal. Thanks for being on. Uh, Kubi case that was good. Snapshots, Gamma floor plans, Gamma. The last guy, James. He was awesome. I love James. Uh, relationships, yes. The theme all across, right? Lofty. I love using Lofty. Yeah, Lofty is look. Listen, Lofty is the core of everything here. So. Remember that. 
Bob, the activity, uh, objection handlings, yes, yes. Uh, landing pages, which unfortunately we really didn't get into, but we will. Creating value statements. Uh, Blake says, oh my God, everything covered today was amazing. Thank you, Blake. Uh, thanks for being on. And then it keeps going. Okay, here we go. Now we need the word lofty. Let's go. Lofty, 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 lofty. We're going to pick somebody in about five seconds, 10 seconds. We're giving away the Apple Watch to one person here. You have to be present. And I'm just going to need your name. If you win, name, email, and phone number. And put it into the chat. And then I'll send it over to you. Well, I won't. It's going to be Lofty who sends it over. All right. Here we go. Let me, it's going too fast. I'm going to have to close my eyes and, and pick and slow down. Let's see here. Uh, let's see what it popped under. Okay. We got one. Daniela, is it Siglarski? Am I doing that right? Daniela Siglarski. That's our winner. Everyone, please congratulate Daniela and everyone else. Thank you so much for being on and supporting Lofty. If you're not part of the Lofty family, uh, we hope that you join or at least take a look at a demo. We put up the link there a few times. And thanks everybody for jumping on and spending three hours on a Friday to better your business and life. With that, I'm going to stay on just a little bit just to get Daniela's information. Give me your info. And let's see if she does. For me, my favorite, man, I had a lot of favorites. I loved where the conversation was going at the beginning with, with Junkie, Adam, and Robert. But I also loved going in with Adam and taking a look at the back end of all of the things that Lofty has. I mean, I've been using Lofty since two, since it was Chime, right? 2017-ish. And the amount of things there, I still don't know everything. And they're adding things. Uh, I don't know that I'll ever catch up. This is why I have a lot of help with this. And then uh, the presentation at the end with James, just bringing it all together and reminding us why we're doing this with Lofty, with Ray's, why we're in the business, how we should pivot, and how we should be looking at this on the buyer side. Fabulous. I loved it. Danielle, I got your information. With that, everyone else, thank you so much. We'll see you next time.